Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. What's going on with my... This, this, this should be here. What is this? What is this? What is this? This is all from, from last week. I, sorry I haven't cleared that out. Um, so yeah, welcome, welcome. Let me put my comments up here. There we go. Everything's got to be working. Um, the, uh, hi, brother from a mother, another mother, big love from Libya. Uh, Mohamed, uh, he always messages me that every week. But yes, True Detective at, at 9 p.m. Thanks. Thanks, Dee Dee. I mean, we can watch True Detective anytime. Um, but before we get to uh, Super Chats and such, um, yeah, I want to talk about Azora High. Azora High was the friends we made along the way. Um, so let's talk about Azora High. Now, when I first when I first started doing this, um, when I first started like uh, going crazy for Ice and Fire and, and, and being in the fandom and, and going on the boards and stuff, um, you know, most of the stuff was about R plus L equals J, but a large amount was also about the Azor High prophecy. People, the fandom was pretty wrapped up in the Azor High prophecy and who was, who is Azor High? You know, who's, who's, who's Azor High? Is it Danny? Is it Stannis? Is it John? Um, taking all the little clues and trying to put it together. And um, one of the things that people kind of like don't piece together is one that like in all of George R. R. Martin's other writing prophecy is usually kind of bullshit. So like, you know, this isn't, this isn't, uh, you know, Harry Potter or Wheel of Time, even with, with it, it, you know, it's it's the you know prophecies are there to be subverted. They're not going to be um, uh, you know fulfilled in the ways that any people expect, if at all. And one of the things that's kind of interesting as well is to track how slapped together. Um, even the prophecy stuff is from George R. R. Martin. Like how how bullshit it is. Like how George was just like spitting shit um, and not really planning it or thinking about it. Because um, you know we kind of know about like you know George's original outline and where the sh where where things were going, and we kind of now even see with the show how one of his outlines kind of like goes. And Azora High is not really is not part of the original outline and it's not really very much part it's not really part of the show like it's mentioned here and there but you know the the, the importance of this prophecy and who azora high is is really nil like it's really really low and i and i want to talk about like how that aspect of it kind of has 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 duped the fandom quite a bit in the same way that like you know, these, these zealots are duped in the story in the same way. Um, and so like thinking about even things like, like if, when you actually talk about like what the prophecy is, you get little pieces here and there and they don't really fit or make sense. They're not cohesive. So like, for example, if we go to, to the first mention of Azora high. Okay. Which, you know, obviously the first mention of Azor Ahai is going to be in, in, it's not even in Game of Thrones, it's in A Clash of Kings. And, we you know, we get Melisandre's kind of first description of, of it. And this is kind of just showing how George didn't really plan this out and wasn't really thinking about this. But the first one, she says, in ancient books of Ashai... It is written that there will come a day after a long summer when the stars bleed and the cold breath of darkness falls heavy on the world. In this dread hour, a warrior shall draw from the fire a burning sword and the sword shall be Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes. And he who clasps it shall be Azor High come again and darkness shall flee before him. Azor Ahai, beloved, beloved of Relore, warrior of light, son of fire, come forth. Your sword awaits you. Uh, come forth and take it into your hand. Now, 
no mention of salt and smoke, no mention of a bleeding star. She says, she says, stars bleed. Later it becomes a bleeding star. Um, just showing how like sloppy this all is. Like you'd think Melisandre would get this right, you know, that the prophecy was a bleeding star. Um, and, you know, much of this never like the importance of Lightbringer itself kind of also like falls off like this Lightbringer is the central thing. And so later in the story, when we hear about Azor Ahai again, it's it's uh, Salador San telling of the whole story to Davos saying, oh, you know, do you guys do you know the whole story of Azor Ahai? Like, uh, you know, it's about you know, the, how he, he, this Nisa Nisa story that he goes into, but it's, again, it's very focused on the sword. Um, but then as we get into, in fact, um, I'm sorry, the, the Davos, the, the, that story from, from, um, Salador Sen doesn't even come into it, into a storm, into a storm of swords. And remember, Storm of Swords is a very quickly written book, and it is like it's a great book, but it's also a bit sloppy. And so you've got this like original prophecy in A Clash of Kings, which is all about the sword. And then they introduce this like Nisa Nisa aspect to it later. Um, and this is where you start getting into in only in a storm of swords do you start hearing about things like when the red star bleeds and darkness gathers, Azor Ahai shall be born again amidst smoke and salt to wake dragons out of stone. The bleeding star has come and gone, and Dragonstone is the place of smoke of salt. Like, I want you to think about like like about how unplanned this is, because A Clash of Kings is actually the book that begins with the with the comet, and and so the comet is there. And there's no mention of the bleeding star. Like George R. R. Martin didn't even connect Comet with Bleeding Star um, in the same in the same book. Like it took the next book for it to be like, oh yeah, no, the comet was the bleeding star. And he kind of inserts this in. He inserts in this like smoke and salt and and all, you know, all of this stuff that he just wasn't even he wasn't even thinking about in the first two books. Um and then every, you know, so the red now you could say that like maybe Melisandre is making this stuff up, but there's a point in which uh, in in Feast where where um, they link it to the where Aemon links it to the his 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 dragon prophecy dreams. He says he says I see it in my dreams. I see a red star bleeding in the sky. I still remember red and shadows in the snow and things like this. Um, Again, a far cry from the the bleeding stars originally, you know. Um, and then the salt, this the salt and smoke thing comes in, which which in a storm of swords, which is just um, he just kind of throws like you could actually search for salt and smoke, and it come it comes up. You know, it come. I think it does come up in. Um, the Tyrian chapters, you know, and then all of a sudden the prophecy is known to these people in Volantis and stuff like this. But, you know, you'd really think that if, if this were, if this were some like big prophecy thing that, that, um, uh, that would be consistent. Now it does make me kind of, you know, wonder like what's, what, what was George's whole plan about this? Like, what was he thinking about? Cause when you actually talk about like, um, prophecies of Jesus, Jesus prophecies are also rather inconsistent. Um, uh, like in the New Testament, uh, like Matthew writes that, oh, you know, Jesus, he fulfilled this prophecy and fulfilled this prophecy. And, and it's the first mention of the prophecy ever. You're like, what? He, that he's a Nazarene? Like, what is that? Like, there's no mention of, of any of Messiah being a Nazarene. Uh, in the Old Testament, but then, then all of a sudden in the New Testament, they're like, "Oh, you fulfilled the prophecy by by being a Nazarene." And you're like, "Where, where, where, where are you coming from with that?" You know, and it's just kind of slapped on. 
And so I do wonder if like George was thinking in that mindset that I can just like throw around a bunch of inconsistent slapped on prophecies that don't make any sense because like the prophecies surrounding Jesus don't really make any sense. And I'm paralleling that situation. Um, and, you know, everybody's waiting for the second coming of Jesus or the first coming of Jesus. But yeah, everybody's waiting for the second coming of Zora High. It's, it's the same situation. So that's the parallel. I'm going to make a sloppy slap together thing where the where the where the pro, where the bits don't really make any sense. And, and, you know, and everybody's asking, like, oh, who's who's Jesus and who's who's the Antichrist and all of these different aspects of of the of the revelation prophecy. And the truth is uh, there's none. It's it's just a big mess. And that's the whole point that it's a big mess because it's supposed to be like real life. Um, but uh, getting on unrelated to these, the um, people who get upset with Arya killing the Night King because it doesn't fit the prophecy are silly. The prophecy is a ch children of the forest up meant to keep dragons around. Uh, I mean, the thing is, is it, it might, if we're going with other George R. Martin writing, there is an aspect of fake prophecy appearing in all sorts of, of stories, wh whether it be men of gray water station or, or um, it's mentioned in a song for Leah or sand Kings or um, uh, the, uh, and, and several times never kill man. Like each of these stories has malicious telepathic visions to alter people's brains and make them see prophecy or make them, make them change their, their opinions on the world. Um, that was, it was just his go-to story was like malicious kind of like uh, stuff like that. So the, the question is like, yeah, do, does, does, is Melisandre receiving you know, false visions of some sort. She's certainly receiving visions, you know, we're in her head and she, and she talks about the vision she's seen. So those are real, you know, like she's seeing something. Um, but the, the question is like, what are they? Um, prophecy doesn't really make sense in and of itself. Cause you have to say like, well, who is sending that prophecy and why send it? Cause prophecy implies that fate is, 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 um, set but if fate's set then what's the point of sending the prophecy i mean even mira reed brings this up but um the uh but you know <laughs> are the uh the, what, but we're talking about like in the show aria killing the night king doesn't fit with prophecy you can make it fit with prophecy if you want um you know there there's a there's a bit in in a feast for crows where she's at the harbor and she smells salt and smoke and so you, one could say that like her, her faceless man career was born among salt and smoke and therefore she's Azora High and her dagger is actually Lightbringer and she shoves it in the breast of the Night King who's Nisa Nisa or some bullshit like that. The thing is you can twist prophecy to, to fit anything you want. And, um, but uh, would the children for us want, keep dragon, want to keep dragons around? I mean, I'm not sure why they would, but... Um, you know, in the show, the children of the forest seem genuinely interested in stopping their creation. I had a little error there. I wonder if I'm going to get a blip. But uh, a little error with my... Hopefully I'm still on. Um, okay. Okay. What do you think about John? Um, what do you think about the John Condal Burn King's landing theory? Also, do you think he would ever wonder if Aegon is a Blackfire? Um, I'm trying to think like why John Con himself would burn King's Landing. Is this the idea that um, he thinks about what Tywin would do to Stony Sept and therefore he would burn it? I think, you know, in, in at least what's set up with like visions and, and, and stuff, 
there's a woman who's fire and so we kind of get this idea that it's either going to be cersei or danny or something or mel would be a woman of fire um that would burn king's landing uh i mean i don't know why i mean you know to prove that he's like you know to to find the uh the villains in there like in the same way that he couldn't he couldn't smoke out the villains in in stony he couldn't get robert and stony steps but i don't know and so he burned everybody out but i don't know who he'd be like who is he going to be searching for who does john con searching for that he needs um in king's landing um like who has legitimacy over aegon the only person that that kind of you know is like we don't really think of cersei being that inspirational you know, would she be hiding and would he need to, would Tommen be hiding and he needs to, he needs to somehow get Tommen out and therefore he, he burns King's Landing in order to get Tommen out. Um, are we tra- creating like a, uh, a parallel situation? Um, let's see. I, I, let's see if there's more of this. Um, Connington will sack King's Landing. He'll be triggered by the bells. And then... And that's it. So I think that the theory comes from the idea that Danny was triggered by bells and therefore John Con might be triggered by bells because he hated... And it would remind him of Stony Sept. And Stony Sept was was what... was He, he thinks, like, how would Tywin have won Stony Sept? And he, he decided to, to burn it. Um, I mean, I don't think there's very much to the theory, but I mean, it is maybe set up that the bells are going to trigger him in some way, but there's a lot of places where bells can be, um, uh, that would, that would, you know, necessarily, you know, cause him to, to go nuts and causing him to go nuts to actually start something on fire. You know, I don't know what, um, like who would be smoking out or how it would feed his, uh, his um his cause like tommen would have to be high like tommen would have to be high hiding and inspiring people in the same way that robert did and and i don't know if i see that with tommen um you know someone you know who who would be in the place that that he would need to he would need to burn he would need to burn uh king's landing to the ground um yeah i don't know i don't know um i'd have to see you know something more intriguing than 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 uh simply like yeah he doesn't like bells and in the in the, in the end of the show we saw bells um fellow wisconsinite here have you ever been to southwest wisconsin namely the uh the prairie du chain area I have not. The only the only thing you learn about like Southwest Wisconsin is that weirdly it didn't have like a glacier over it, and so it's like different different land out there. Um, you know, I, I I was a little kid in Wisconsin in the uh, for the, for the most part. My 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 time there was mainly in the Milwaukee area, and then like in the summertime I would head up to Boulder Junction in the north um, to go to camp. Uh, so really, like you know, believe it or not, I've never been to Madison. Never been to Madison. Only went to the Dells for the first time uh, um, a few weeks ago. Never been to Green Bay. You know, it's a weird thing about like being a little kid someplace because you get a you, you don't necessarily see very much of it and understand it. I certainly, you know, it's not like I know like the restaurants or the bars or any of the places like in Milwaukee. Even it's like my my life was like knowing three or four streets, you know, and, and things like that. Um. <laughs> I'm Azora a uh, high right now. Um Hey PJ, a few of my friends who refused to vote D on moral grounds because of his stance towards towards Israel uh, uh because of Biden's stance towards Israel. What arguments would you make here? Uh I mean it's just really silly like like um it, it's it's uh the Republican party is has has no better position so it's like what what like what's the 
what's the moral ground here um right like Like, morality is about human consequences. Like, that's what morality is, right? So, in a game theory sense, what does not voting for Biden do? Like, in a moral sense. Like, how does it improve anybody's life? Because if Republicans get elected, it's even worse. Like, it's even worse, right? Um. I mean, you can actually think about it in like the, the 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 train track like situation. Would you send the train to run over a hundred people, or would you send the train to run over ten thousand people? And you can sit there and be like, "Well, I both situations are immoral, so therefore I'm not going to participate in which track the train goes on." And you're like, "But." <laughs> what? Like that doesn't change. That doesn't improve the world. There's nothing moral. Like when I think of something moral, like moral things are things that are going to improve the world and improve like people, like people's lives, like, you know, increase utility, do something. Even if you're like, whether you're utilitarian or a deontologist or anything or, or into religious objective morality, like, like, not participating in in an election doesn't do any good so it's not moral like th- i think your friends don't understand what morality is like i think they like it i mean seriously like just break it down like what is morality like what is it and how does not voting for like the Democrats who they pr- likely agree with on every other issue and the Republicans are in the even worse situation with it, with, with, with regards to like, you know, supporting Israel and like, you know, uh, and, and, and the war. So like, what, like, what is moral? Like, I'd really love like somebody to explain, like maybe someone else could explain like that, like, what is moral about not voting for for Biden in this situation? How are you making the world a better place? Like how how is it? You know, like it just doesn't it doesn't it doesn't square at all. Um, on like what morality is? No, I mean what it sounds like is like, you know, they'd like to virtue signal. And that's what they're really interested in, because if they're not interested in morality, like in any de- in any definition of morality that I can think of. Um, so it's just. Yeah, it's just kind of I, I don't get it, like, I don't get it. They, I think I think they need to take some sort of like intro to 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 philosophy or, or, or morality class. Cause any classification of morality, I don't see how not voting for, for Biden is moral, you know, like, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Like Biden, even if objectively bad for Palestinians is subjectively better than the alternative right so like that's it that's just it like the two tracks like would you like would you like the the train to run over a thousand people or or ten thousand people and then standing back and being like well i'm not going to participate is somehow the moral position no no that's just there's no there's no any there's the lack of understanding of it like it's not that's not utilitarian or or deontology or anything so i don't know i don't know what it is i mean someone can explain it in fact i'm gonna go right down to see if anyone can put i mean that's the thing is blue maga 
<laughs> I want someone to differentiate ethics and morals for me, please. Uh, it's semantics, and it's it's going to depend on who you're going to ask. There's actually a big joke on this in in the world in the um, in the in the movie Election, um, where Matthew Broderick is like asking his students, like, "What's the difference between morals and ethics?" And of course, a bunch of high school students aren't going to like have any answers, so they're like trying their best, and the students are like. Um, is morality like what you believe and like ethics, like how you implement it? And, you know, Matthew Braddock's like, I think we're getting there. But then and you never find out in the movie the difference between morals and ethics. Some people say that morals imply religious backing while like ethics is human. But like that's all bullshit because it's all human. There's no there's no gods like. There's no difference between morals and ethics. It's 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 a semantic, useless like differentiation. So you don't have to worry about it. It's dumb. It's very very dumb. Um, is the Valencar prophecy going to be subverted? Uh, I think that all prophecy is dumb. I don't think George R. R. Martin is really thinking about it that much. I don't think it's uh, it's something he he's paying attention to. Um, and I think that, uh, in, in a sense, like whatever happens to happen, like whatever happens, like someone, I mean, obviously we're never going to have the end of a book, but, but like, we're the way Cersei dies, someone would come up with something on how it was really the Valonqar. Like, it's so fucking like broad, right? Like the younger brother, like everybody's a fucking younger brother in the story. Like everybody, a sec, you know, uh, the second sons could kill her, you know. Oh, the, the Jamie's a younger brother. Tyrion's a younger brother. Like everybody, you know, it's just it's silly. And then and then once you kind of go, oh, but then in these prophecies, like, uh, j you know, the sex and gender aren't necessarily that important. Oh, so so it could be like anybody it could be the younger sister, you know. And it's it's silly. And it's so ridiculously broad. Like, that's a really ridiculously broad one. Um, that's, like, so bad that it's hard to even, like, take it seriously. Um, you know, so I I don't know. I just don't think it's a... Um, um, but, yeah. But this is the thing is like the, like the prophecy says that Azor Ahai will be reborn with the bleeding star. So it can't be Danny or Jon Snow. They're too old. Well, this is the whole thing. Like when you actually like pin down something where you're like, oh, this is clearly not them fulfilling it. Someone will have some sort of lore. But weren't they metaphorically reborn? You know, like wasn't Danny metaphorically reborn like in the pyre and all that kind of bullshit? Like and th this is the whole thing about like religious text. Um, there's always this out when you talk to like somebody like who's, who's, who, who's religious. Right. And you, you say to them, okay. They'll be like, oh, and you know, the Bible is hundred percent true. And you're like, really like, okay, well, what about like this part? Like, what about Noah's Ark? Come on. And then you'll get them to be like, oh, well, you know, that part's more metaphor. And you're like, Re really? So any part that's like clearly wrong is metaphor. And then any part that's right is like proof that like the text is like perfect, you know, and it's the same. It's the same with these prophecies. You can just twist everything to, to say whatever you want. You know, everything fits and everything doesn't. It's so easy. So uh, that's why, you know, I just yeah, wait, I mean, I agree with you. Like they weren't born. They weren't born under the bleeding star. You're right. Someone will be like, well. It, metaphorically weren't they reborn <laughs> you know um uh, i think george r. r martin has written anything non a song of ice and fire lately that'll come out later considering the rest of his career sh uh, uh science fiction short stories i'd be shocked if there aren't any a thousand world stories in a drawer um well we certainly know there's part of avalon uh, so Avalon was the novel that was in, that was set in the thousand worlds universe that he was going to write. And he got so far on it. We're not sure how far, but let's say a quarter or something and then quit. Um, 
And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people read into that um, and say, well, like, has George R. R. Martin, you know, is he a quitter? Is Can he not actually finish anything? Because he didn't finish Avalon. And, you know, and when you read something like um, all of his novels, his, his, like, Dying of the Light or or um, Armageddon Rag or um, Fever Dream, they all end really quickly. Almost like he was writing, he was writing, and then he's just like, fuck, got to put an end on this. And then just like wrap it up. And he just wraps it up. Um, you know, so George R. R. Martin was a trained short story writer. And, he, you know, he's very good at endings, but I don't think he's very good at maybe third act or something he just kind of writes 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 and then doesn't know what to do and then there's an ending now does he have other stuff i bet he has some short stories that were never published i bet he has a whole bunch um keep in mind that like back in the day you know he would send off short stories to sci-fi magazines and then they would be accepted or not um and I imagine there's some that were just not good enough that he even like wanted to send them off or they were just, he sent them off to a few places and they were, they were never published or something. I imagine that there's a few stories like this. Um, um, but has he come out with anything like new? Like has he, has he decided to like sit down and, and write a story? Um, I don't think so. I don't, I think he's just far too busy. And I don't think he's writing any short stories either. Like, I don't think he's really working on Ice and Fire. I don't think he's really working on short stories either. So, um, what's your opinion about the whole last hero story? I mean, I think with any of the, the prophecies, you're supposed to find elements of it. And you're supposed to make the reader think like, oh, these, these, you know, this could be this person and this could, could mirror this person. And it's supposed to like, you know, make the person, make the reader think all of these characters are important and that, that things are coming to some big epic conclusion and stuff. Um, so I think when he's, when he talks about like the last hero story, you're supposed to obviously think like, oh, maybe, maybe all of these main characters are going to be like, the band of heroes that go that go with with the last hero to and you know it's one of them's going to be Jamie and one's going to be Ariane and one's going to be Brienne and that dog that they're with is in there as the hound you know like maybe you're supposed to think something like that um but George R. R. Martin again he's this gardener he just kind of throws shit at the wall so you know maybe he's going to come back to it later maybe he wouldn't you know um I want to try to say like how often is the last hero story even see the last hero um is at least mentioned in a game of thrones as like this very early thing unlike like azora high um so at least that has some genesis right from the beginning but yeah, he kind of says here, the last hero story says, cold and death filled the earth. The last hero determined to seek out the children in hopes of their ancient magics to win back the armies the men had lost. He set out into the deadlands with a sword, a horse, a dog, a dozen companions. For years he searched until he despaired um, of ever finding the children of the forest in their secret cities. One by one, his friends died and his horse and finally, even his dog and his sword froze so hard the blade snapped when he tried to use it. And the others smelled the hot blood in him and came silent on his trail, stalking with the packs of pale white spiders, big as hounds, you know. Um, so, I mean, in one way, it's there to paint, like, you know, the story of the others and such. But you're, you're supposed to be thinking, like, maybe, maybe all of these, maybe all of these people are going to come together. Maybe that's why. But... You know, how much work is he going to put in actually shoving the story in? See, this is the, this is the whole thing is like George R. R. Martin straight up admits that his writing style is to not outline and to and to just garden and see where the story goes. And then people sit here and like overanalyze prophecy, which prophecy is a structured outline. Like it's a like it's so 
you know, they don't jive. They don't fit. You can't have a guy who's like, I just write randomly. I just see where the story goes. And then something else that's like, no, these are the events. Do, 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 do. Like they, they don't line up. Um, but it doesn't stop everybody. It doesn't stop everybody from, from thinking about it. Um, <laughs> would it be a riot if Azora High were a pyramid scheme? <laughs> a pyramid. <laughs> like try to think about like, so Azora High like has to like send out 10, 10 warriors to send out 10 warriors to send out 10 warriors um, in order to try to get, get enough people to, uh, to uh, what fulfill the, I don't know. To, <laughs> like he's the head. Let me think of like, if you send out 10 people and you, what, like are born of, does each person in the pyramid have to be born of, of, of salt and, Oh, I see. Well, so some people argue that like all of the people together in the last hero's story, like each piece, like fits fits together in, as a Zora High. That it takes many people in a big pyramid, and that the the collection of the people is is a Zora High. You know, kind of like the friends we made along the way. But it's again, it's all this kind of me metaphorical stuff. Um. But I'm trying to imagine it actually as like Amway, <laughs> like the religion of the old gods is actually Amway. You have to free 10 slaves. Um, thoughts on House Rosby's succession crisis. Um, I, by the way, I'm just... I've, my, my eyes were caught by this other question above, so I'm, I might get to the other question above. Just, but thoughts on House Rosby's succession crisis? Um, I think in general, like the so a lot of people like bring up the the um, Rosby succession crisis, and they talk about Rosby's ward and how Rosby's ward um, has like taken control of of the lands and you know, everybody wants to know the identity of Rosby's ward and, and wondering if it could perhaps be all of our fray or something. Um, and I don't think that really makes sense because why would, you know, Ro like Giles Rosby has actually been in King's Landing for most of the story that we know. Um, somebody, like no one would hand over the entire castle to a ward that, has only been there a few months that barely knows Giles, you know, like if, the, if Giles has a ward that he cares about and, and has given him so much responsibility that, that the ward could take over the castle, he's going to be somebody that, that knows the, that he's lived with for many, many, many years. Now, once you kind of establish like the Rosby ward as somebody that's been there for years, we run out of people that he could be. Like there's no one really interesting in the story that like we could be like that we know about that we could be like oh that no that's the that's the Rosby Ward like it could be literally like just anybody and no no one really fits um, at that point and so I think it's only in the sense that like the succession crisis involves Stokeworths as well I think it's a way to sort of like combine the Stokeworth and Rosby issue. Because Stokeworth, of course, has the has the brawn situation, and and the fate of Rosby and Stokeworth are important because John Con comes in, um, he can he can take the take King's Landing faster if he has control of Rosby and Stokeworth. So, you know, I don't necessarily think George knew who the Rosby Ward was. I think he's, you know, he's. He's just kind of creating a complicated mess for when John Con comes in to sweep in quickly. And we kind of know that John Con has to sweep in quickly. Um, you know, we only have two books left. And so if if you're talking about getting to a Dance of the Dragon situation, you have to have John Con take over Westeros at breakneck speed. You just there's no dilly-dallying around us, you know, because then Danny has to come in and fight them 
and then they then they have to finish their fight and then deal with the others. You know, if you're talking about the three stages of the story, War of the Five Kings, the Second Dance of the Dragons, or the uh, da- Daenerys' Invasion was the original second one, and then the, the War of the Others is the third. So, you know, if you're going to have that set up, you need, like, John kind of, like, everything just has to just go the right way for John Con. So I think whatever the succession crisis is about, the ward is going to be pro John Con. And so it just doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter who he's, who he is. I, he just has to be a blanket pro John Con, pro Aegon person. And that's it. So that John, to facilitate John Con's like sweeping across the, um, the continent. So it, it, it's sort of like, you know, it doesn't really matter what house he is or what person he is, because in the end, it, it's, it's about his function, like the crisis and the ward and the function is just to hand it over to John Con as fast as possible, because that's just what the story necessitates. Like it has to be, you know, you know, it's like you're in the um, imagine you're watching like a rom-com and. You know, there's like 20 minutes of the rom-com left and they haven't gotten together. You'd be like, ah, you know, like <laughs> what's going to happen? Well, we know what's going to happen. We know that Aegon and John Con are going to take over the kingdom. So how are they going to take over the kingdom? Well, you know, the, they got to do it as easy as possible. That's the easiest way is for that ward to be pro Aegon. Um, doesn't matter who he is. He's just pro Aegon. Um... But yes, uh, any advice on getting over a breakup? And do you think there's any circumstances where you should get back together with an ex? Um, I personally do not think there's... Uh, look, if there's no baggage, like you don't have kids or anything, anything like that, um, is there a reason to get back together with an ex? Like... I always say, like, it's not that I haven't seen people do it and have it work, but it's just like, why bother? Like, what's the fucking point? Like, there is a million, like, other great people out there. Like, you know, if if you're at a buffet, an all-you-can-eat buffet, and you pick up, you know, a piece of chicken, and it falls on the ground, like, why would you bother picking up that piece of chicken? When you've got a whole array of clean chicken, like why, why would you want the dirty thing, the dirty piece of chicken that's fallen on the floor when you've got more chicken right there at the buffet? So I, I, I like, it's not that I don't understand the feelings, you know, like obviously like feelings are intense and you, you think this person's really special and you need to connect with them and there's trauma and there's, there's all sorts of things going on in your head about you know, broken hearts and broken egos and all sorts of things. Um, so the big thing about getting through a breakup, um, best advice, go out and just fuck as many people as you can. Just go out and wallow and it doesn't matter. Just go out and hook up with as many people as you can. It's just the best. It's, it's all you can do. It's all you can do. <laughs> Um, stay entertained with your friends. Like, don't try not to, to, to get involved with the person again. It's cause it's just, there's just, I don't know. It's just, it's so messy and it's just not worth it when there's just so many more people out there. Um, I mean, you know, maybe if you have kids together or something, I could see reasons to, to get it back together with your ex or something, you know, but I don't know. It's just like, uh, it's like I say, the world, you're at an all you can eat buffet and there's so many incredible people out there. So many. So you don't need, you don't need to tolerate like that. And I, you know, and people, people feel like they're not at an all you can eat buffet and that there's only a limited number of people and all this person's really special, but I guarantee like, there's just so many great people out there, better people, nicer people, you know, but yeah, the only thing you can do uh, is is you know hook up with as many people as you can until you can then move on 
and that that might take that might take the better part of a year. Maybe it'll take a year and a half. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. You'll eventually move on. You'll eventually eventually find somebody that's nicer and better, and you're gonna be like, oh my god. Um, not that you won't have like a bruised ego and still think about the person. Like, oh, I can't believe I fucked that relationship over. I can't believe that person dumped me. Fuck them. Like, you'll always have those kinds of like residual. Um, insecurity issues but logically speaking like you're eventually going to look back and be like oh my god what was i thinking what was i thinking when when uh um you know when i when it when they're when i met now this better person you know oh man but give me give me thinking about exes ugh, ugh. um Oh, why would John Aaron prefer to foster Sweet Robin with Stannis instead of Ned? Winterfell seems vastly better. His past with Ned, Tully family, and safer. Hmm. Um. All of that is true. You you are right. I think I think Ned Stark is a is a much better choice to foster Sweet Robin. I think. The only reason Stannis is chosen is that Stannis is in King's Landing with John Aaron. Uh, I think people, because the story begins with Stannis on um, ignoring the pro prologue, because the story begins with Stannis having fled and on Dragonstone, when Ned, you know, Ned arrives in King's Landing. We often don't think about Stannis as being this guy that was in King's Landing for years and everybody knowing him. You know, Tyrion doesn't talk about him very much. He lived in the same place as Stannis and Solis for years. He hardly ever talks about him. Tyrion hardly ever talks about Sweet Robin. Like, Sweet, he lived with Sweet Robin for years, all in King's Landing. They never talk about it. You know, when it, when when Tyrion arrives in the Vale, it's almost like Sweet Robin is a is a you know a stranger. Um, and Lys is, you know, a stranger rather than we lived at court together for fucking years, you know, like, um, so, th but there's this like reverse thing with, with yeah, this, this idea that like Stannis wasn't there, like Stannis was there. Like, so, you know, if you're John Aaron and you've been living with Stannis for years and you haven't seen Ned in, you know, what, because he hasn't seen Ned in 17, in, in. 17 years, you know, when's the last time John Aaron saw, saw Ned and he sees Stannis every day and sweet Robin knows Stannis and, you know, and it's just, it just seems a lot easier. Like they're sitting there, John Aaron and Stannis are doing the, their, their sleuthing, figuring out the bastard situation. They can hop him, hop sweet Robin on a, on a, on a ship. I mean, it, it, so in a sense, it makes, just makes sense. Like, why would you ask, like, some guy you haven't seen in a long time who's a million miles away when Stannis is right there? Um, plus, like, Stannis seems to be, you know, calling arms and things like this, and it's it's going to get messy. So, um, so yeah, it's that, that that's it. That's all there is to it, um, is the... Uh, um, I'm just trying to think of, uh, like, anything else. But I think that that's just it, that they were... They were doing this this uh, sleuthing together, and Stannis was there, and they've been hanging out for years. Um, you know, they would often have lunch. Um, <laughs> abstain from voting Dem. Let the U.S. fall into autocracy and allow a country of coll uh, or collective with a better progressive agenda to take over. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the 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 joke of like, does <clears throat> does accelerationism like does accelerationism? Um, do we have any examples of that actually working? Like, you know, like let's let's let it, let's let America like really go to hell, and then from the ashes, some phoenix will rise. You know, like, ugh. Well, I don't know if we have a real example of that. Um, like, let's, let's just do it. You know, like, uh, in fact, I don't even know how, like, how does autocracy and, you know, how does 
fascism end. When it when it when it came to World War II, the U.S. like did it militarily. You, they pulled Germany out and Japan out militarily. But you know, waiting for this moment of like dictatorship and then and then the the public to to rise up again over and over again. I mean, I guess you got the French and their and their many many revolutions over and over again. Um, you know, but you know until they until they you know, got it moderately, right? But it just, you know, do you really want America to go through that? You know, do you really want, like, <laughs> do you really want, uh, like, uh, honestly, Trump, like, um, like to have nuclear weapons after, like, seeing what he is? Like, it's just, like, fucking crazy. It's fucking crazy to be like, oh, you know, Biden and his Israel policy, even though Trump's, like, even crazier. Um on that on that specific very minute issue that doesn't really affect americans like yes it's horrible it's horrible that tens of thousands of gazans are dying it's a tragedy it is doesn't really affect americans um um hasn't every single american president done war crimes depends how you define war crime um but you know, but depend you know, depends how you define war crime. But yeah, there there's like, whatever. There's like reasonable levels of of um, collateral damage, you know, and stuff like that. But uh, uh, to, for something to be considered war crime, um, and so there there's the question of like whether you're beyond that. Like if you're talking about like Obama, like. Being like, okay, you're allowed to to attack some wedding where some terrorists are going to be and people at the wedding die, you know, in, in Pakistan. Like, what's the reasonable amount of collateral damage and stuff like that? It all depends. It all depends. But, you know, I don't know if Jimmy Carter did any war crimes. Um, if you're if you're really asking that seriously, I don't I don't think Jimmy Carter committed any, any war crimes that I know of. You know, um, um, <laughs> never tell someone who believes <laughs> revelation is a prophecy that was written to help Christians in the city of Rome cope with Nero. Um, <sighs> When was Revelation written? So, I mean, we're, we're, I guess we're, we're in the wrong time period. I'll be like, I was about to be like, Nero's a little early for Revelation. So they say Revelation's written around 100 AD. And Nero, what, Nero lives in what, 40? I want to say like 44. What is, when did Nero die? 68 he ruled from like 44 to uh, no he lived he ruled uh he was born 37 so he ruled 17 years i know so 51 to 68 is what nero is so you're talking like um a good 40 years after nero but also keep in mind that like there there's a lot of things like so nero like the whole like Nero persecuting Christians thing is largely Christian myth. Like, yes, there is the story of after Rome burned, probably by accident because Rome got set on fire and got burned down like every 20 years. Um, but anyway, the, the, to, to find someone to blame that Nero blamed Christians and would like throw Christians to dogs, right? Um, the problem with this story is that it's, it's a Suetonius story and it's, you know, Suetonius lives like a hundred years after, after Nero. So, um, you know, how many Christians were really living in Rome in during, like during the time of the fire and would they be really blamed for it and things like this? Uh, maybe, you know, like it maybe it happened. It's it's it's, but 
so how many Christians are you like, like 12 Christians or what, you know, whatever. But, you know, this idea that like Nero was the serial persecutor of Christians is largely an invention of, of, of like Christians later on. Now, Nero absolutely later on in Christian literature, not the Bible, but Christian literature afterwards, um, becomes this symbol of of anti-Christianness. And he was referred to as the Antichrist in Christian literature around 400 AD, like a lot of this stuff about and this was largely because there was a myth that Nero was going to come back from the dead and retake and, and become emperor again. And this was like a, a strange, enduring myth about Nero. It was really weird. Um, it was mainly because like Nero was rather unpopular in Western Rome, but was very popular in Eastern Rome. And the Easterners were a little more religious. And so these there are these like legends of like big Nero fans that were like, no, Nero's going to come back. He's going to come back. And then it just kind of became like snowballed into like Nero's going to come back from the dead. And so then all of a sudden, like the Christians were like, well, Nero's going to come back from the dead. He sounds like he's the Antichrist. And then he becomes this like symbol of like Christian persecution. But Nero didn't. Pro- he probably didn't persecute any Christians only because there weren't there probably weren't any Christians around. But I don't know if he did persecute some Christians, it was probably not very many of them. But anyway, you got me on a on a tangent because on on because uh, I, I I love the geo the Julio Claudians. Anyway, the uh, Conan the Barbarian uh, rights holders have taken the licenses away from Netflix um, for the Conan Netflix series. Also, Barbarlier is being remade. Huh. That's really interesting. The um This is um I wonder why Oh, oh, Barbarella, Barbarella. I, I'm sorry that I was like, I'm, I'm being so silly. Barbarella, the Jane Fonda movie. Um, Barbarella is. I remember even seeing Barbarella when I was when I was uh, when I was um, little, and it's just so ridiculous. It's just like I think there's a scene where she's put inside a piano and like. She's made to. She's made to come, by somebody like, playing the piano. Yeah. Yeah, she's put in. Jane Fonda is put in the orgasmatron. Yeah, it's um, it's this piano that like, makes her come. Fucking crazy, man. Fucking crazy. Like, what a, what a movie. Well, <laughs> they make. There it is. <laughs> She's put inside this piano. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I um I think that's uh that's fucking crazy that that they would make bar- remake Barbarella. Um but I guess they're they're really out of out of ideas, but uh <laughs> the uh, but about, about this Conan the Barbarian Netflix thing. Um I didn't even know so Conan the Barbarian it's no longer happening is it that they're trying to sell it to someone hot with with more money or something It's something because for a long time we were hearing that there's going to be this Conan the Barbarian movie on Netflix, but then I don't know anything could have could have happened. I don't know if they're they're like shopping it around and and uh, and and trying to get more money from somebody else, or a, a movie came along, or Netflix just dropped it. Um, No disrespect, the Bible is a really interesting read if, if you take it as a story. Great, great world building. 
<laughs> there's some funny stuff in it. I mean, I think like in the same sense that we like compare stuff in, in, in ice and fire, like people do it with the Bible and it's really fun. Like, you know, like there's, um, there's mentions of these giants, the Nymphidians before the flood and there's mentions of them after. And so there's this question of like, well, how did the giants survive the flood? Like if, if Noah didn't bring them on because he just brings the animals and, and his own family. And so they actually have like art of like the giants hanging on the side of, of the, uh, the ark. Um, I want to say, what are they called? Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the Nephilims. Nephilims, Nym Nymphili Nymphilians, yeah, Nymphilians, not Nymphidians, Nymphilians. And so this idea of like these Nymphilians, like hanging on the side of Noah's Ark, um, so that they could they could somehow survive, and just like other fan theory, like it's funny because it's just like fan theories, like how the how the Nym Nym Nymphilia uh, Nephiliums the Nephilims like, uh, like survived and stuff like that, that the Bible has all of these fan theories as well. And there's all sorts of contradictions, like fun, fun contradictions that people come up, like find, and then have to try to reconcile. I mean, like the new Testament is, is ridiculous in that, like, you know, in one gospel, Jesus like is born and then goes home to, to, um, to Nazareth. And then in another gospel, he flees to Egypt and they, they, they directly contradict, but you know, most people don't read it that closely and don't care. Don't think about it. But then the people that are really obsessed over it are like, well, how do we reconcile this? How do we come up with a, a way for two gospels that directly contradict to exist in the same place? Um, you know, and, and keep in mind that, like, in the past, people weren't so obsessive about, like, the Bible being truth. Like, you know, people, like, in the olden times, people were just like, well, one of the stories was a little off. Like, big deal. Like, now it's like, no, this is God's word. And God's word is truth. And it needs to, it needs to be perfect. And you're like, ah, no one, like, in the past, no one believed that. Like, why are people obsessive now? But, you know, how do you reconcile something like that? Um Need to sleep right now here in South Carolina. Thank you for your content and manifest another year of outlandish theories and maybe wins. I'm delusional. Yeah, I mean, good night. But there, there's the uh, sweet dreams. But yeah, there's no, there's no way wins is coming out this year, um, 2024. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's funny because um, fuck, I was gonna, I was gonna do this video with um. I wanted to I wanted to do it with with Carmine about maybe I still will if I convince him but um I made a trolley problem memes video last Jesus. month and you what guys seemed to enjoy That really came on that was cosmic skeptic all of a sudden like in a video okay let's see here it's um season 8 watch trolley problem memes Why do, what are, episode 3 Why do they keep Let's doing go these preventable things? genocide I don't, Alex O'Connor, stop, stop, stop. Okay. All right. Um, here it is. Uh, like if we go to the, the end. Oh my God. Let's, uh, this, this sadness, this, this is going to make all of you very depressed. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so we come to the end here. Hey, Marius, you get all the way to the end here. The year 2023. You guys it. remember this? Plutonium for one more trip. I better make this one count. Hey, George, write the book. 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 Write book. Rybuck, 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 Rybuck. 
I can't believe it's <sighs> year 2023. I had put it as a fucking joke that there's no way it would take that long. Like this was back in 2018. This, this, this came out. Right. So like, uh, right. When did this come out? No, I'm sorry. 2019. So this was back May of 2019. Like I put that as if as a joke, like no one would think that I'm going to put it way far in the future as something funny. And now we're, now we're past that. We're past that joke day. Like that's how bad things are. But yeah, nothing in 20, nothing. It's not happening in 2024. No, 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 no. Um, mm, some prophecies self-fulfill. Uh, for example, are we still fighting over the Holy Land? Westeros could select a leader based on signs just, and then just use obsidian. Yeah, th this is this is the um, um, the self fulfilling aspect of prophecy. Like prophecy's purpose is either to create a a time loop, or there is a nefarious reason that you put a prophecy in somebody's head because you want them to secretly do that. You know, and I, I for example, think that you know, like when you look at Cersei and her actions, like. Oh, you're going to have three kids. And then she had three kids. Well, Cersei has fucking control over how many kids she has. You know, they, they exist in a world of birth control. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, she, ex she absolutely could have had more kids, you know, to, to ruin the prophecy or fewer kids, to have fewer the prophecy. So she's, she's like doing it. Like she's self-fulfilling it. Um, there, there was a, uh, an interesting, series it was a book before it called flash forward it's a fantastic premise but the premise of the story and the series was okay it was okay i i'm i'm you know i watched the whole thing um it only made it one season because it was too expensive uh the, it got okay ratings but it was way more expensive than the ratings would allow but flash forward the premise was every single human being on earth passes out for like three minutes and in that three minutes that they've passed out, they receive a vision of what they'll be doing in the future. In the show, I think it's six months in the future. I think in the in the uh, in the book, it's many years. But nonetheless, everybody gets this vision of like what they're going to be doing six months in the future. Um, and so our protagonist, who is a recovering alcoholic, is drunk in his in his vision. And his wife, and he's in a happy, they're in a happily, mar uh, happily married. In her vision, she's having sex with a man that she's never seen before, but and it's not her husband, you know. And it's just like oh, everybody has these interesting stories of what they're what they're doing six months from now. And then some people have no visions at all, implying that they're dead. Um, and so, I know that it, they didn't explore it too much in the in the show, but I know in the book, there's this entire faction of people that want the world to come out the way their vision has intended. And then there's those that, that want to subvert it. Um, you know, the idea being that, you know, half of people would, would, would see, would see something like this as welcoming and half would reject it. Um, and so it's a, and so it was kind of a fascinating premise. Um, I wish it would have gone on, wish the show would have gone on longer. So it was, it was a good show, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you have to ask yourself, like, you know, if you received a vision, what would you do? I think in the show, they do it with some, I think there's one guy who he has this vision of him being in a cafe with this like Japanese woman and she has a vision of him. And so the two of them like decide that they need to go and try to find each other, even though, you know, so they're trying to fulfill themselves. And then other people are, you know, for instance, the woman that's trying not to have sex with someone that's not her husband, like tries not to. And she succeeds. She doesn't have the affair. And I think um, the hero, he at the last moment decides like, fuck it. And he actually does like drink for his uh, and get drunk for his um, last vision. Um Oh, apparently Netflix wanted to subvert Conan. Uh, but the uh, license holders, heroic signatures of Robert E. Howard Purist said no. Um, I mean, Conan is all about subversion, isn't it? Isn't he? Isn't he kind of an unpredictable character? 
that's too bad. Um, I mean, it's interesting that they would, I'm sure it was more of like, I'm sure money was involved in it because, you know, these people that uh, have these rights, these rights, you know, they, 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 they want to get their payday more, more than anything else than, than like protecting, protecting the purity, the purity of something, you know? Um, that's a question of, uh, Huh. Um. Here's the funny thing. Let's see here. Conan has a really weird public domain history. Um. So I think Conan, Conan the Barbarian first appeared in Weird Tales in 1932. At the time of publication, the copyright duration for works was compiled with all the requirements, could enjoy 95 years of the copyright. So he becomes public domain in 2028. But only that character. Um, so Conan, Conan actually becomes public domain pretty soon. So I would think that the the estate would be looking for their somebody else is saying 24 1924 1932 um you'd think they'd be looking for their like last payday like the the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle estate the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle estate is insane but trying to get their last paydays um even though like even though like Sherlock Holmes is well lapsed into the public domain. Like there were a few stories that um, had not. And so the Doyle estate would like sue people for like, oh, there's an aspect of of his personality that's not uh, that's uh, that you're that you're writing. You know, he likes dogs, you know, he doesn't like dogs until late Conan, like late <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. Um but uh, and then for a lot of them, like the Doyle estate would send the Doyle estate, even though Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain, they would still send like collection stuff for rights, but it would be like a modest amount. So people would just be like, fuck it, I guess I'll pay it. Like, you know, you send some like studio a bill for $10,000, you know, and they're like, well, that's nothing. Okay, fine. We'll avoid the legal stuff by just paying them off. And so even though Sherlock Holmes was public domain, they would still be collecting money. Uh, it's just funny, funny as hell. But um, let's see here. Mm -mm 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 -mm. But a lot, but there are some other things about like license and then like what aspects of Conan can be in it. Like, you know, just the first story and his name. Because if you're going to subvert it a bunch, if you're going to subvert Conan a bunch and he's and he's practically public domain, then you don't need to, you don't need kind of anything. It's only when you kind of like follow his stuff from later stories. And um, have you ever run across anyone with a Song of Ice and Fire last name? I knew a Stark while I was in the army with a direwolf tattoo. He hates it now. <laughs> uh, let me think. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, any that I would know here. Um, anyone with last name Ball? Betley, no. Blackmire, Blount, Boggs, Bracken, Botley. I don't know. Let's see. Briar, Brook, Broom, Bulwer, Brune. There's apparently a house bush. I think I've known some. I think I knew a bush. Um, that's a pretty. That's kind of cheating, though. Um. Cool. 
Cray, Cress, I don't know, Crab, Cox. Cox is a, is a house. That's probably one. I don't know if I've known any Cox other than celebrities. Um, Pharaoh, Faring, Farron. Garner, Glover. I've known some Glovers. That's a, that's an easy one. Um, uh, but the, um, fuck, what happened to me the other, the other day? The other day I, I ran into somebody with a, uh, did I tell this story already? I ran it. I, I'm trying to remember what name it was, but the other day I ran into somebody with an ice and fire name and I asked him about it and he said he had, he had no idea what I was talking about. Um, fuck, what was it? God damn it. I ran into somebody the other day who had an ice and fire name and I, and I, and I like for a first name and I was like, Oh, so people give you shit all the time. And they're like, what? And, and, and I mentioned it and I was like, no, I've no, no one's ever, no one's ever mentioned that. And I was like, really? Um, and I can't remember what it was, but fuck. Hmm. I was like very surprised too. Oh well, bad story, bad story. Um, I think Martin is heavily uh, influenced by Tolkien cosmology. Yet people think Martin revolutionized the genre. Do Martin's difficulties come from weak cosmology or falling back on Tolkien? Um. So I had, and we have actually a whole podcast about this. So I have a podcast back with men of the West. Um, and he, he, he has a, uh, a YouTube channel on, on, on um, Lord of the Rings. And I asked him about this very issue. Cause I, I, if you w go back and like watch my geology of, Game of Thrones video and stuff like that. One of the main differences that, that I differentiate between George R. Martin and Tolkien is that, you know, when you look at George R. Martin, when he talks about history, you're supposed to question the history. You're supposed to be like, hmm, that sounds like bullshit. Like, what's the real history? Well, when you read the Silmarillion and you hear about like, you know, Uvatar creating the dwarves out of stone and the, the, you know, the elves creating elves and shit like that. Um, you're not supposed to question it, that that's actually like what happened. And, and men of the West actually said, well, that's not necessarily very accurate. He, he admits that like, that's how most fans view it, but he, the Tolkien definitely plays with history being wrong and history being, you know, not necessarily, uh, the actual events of the past in, in, um, and in fact, the entire point of having Lord of the Rings being written by, um, Bilbo is like an example of this, you know, or written, written by Frodo and, you know, Bilbo, like, you know, that, that did, did these, did, you know, did these big events really happen or are they exaggerated by our Hobbit writers, by our Hobbit authors? I was like, oh, that's that's an interesting that's an interesting little rub, you know. And I, I understand it. I know about the the error the in the first the first edition of Lord of the Rings has different events with Gollum and things being changed and stuff like this, and 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 the events being different once you get to to Lord of the Rings and and and, and changing things and Bilbo being this unreliable narrator, you know. It's like I get that specifically, but. Um, you know, may, and maybe Men of the West was overstating it, but but definitely there is a huge even even if they're you know even if Tolkien was thinking about it some there is a matter of scale. George R. R. Martin definitely wants us to hear a story and then question it completely and just think it's bullshit. Um, and I don't I don't really understand like the people that really look at Westeros history and believe it wholesale when like oh well you know that's when the children of the forest broke the arm of dorn and you're like like the characters in story question the history the ter characters in story samuel tarley tells us that like all of this is bullshit and the timelines don't work out 
Like, so it, it's odd when the characters in the story are telling us like, no, this is, this is not it. Um, versus like, I don't, Lord of the Rings, like, you know, I think everybody believes in God and like they're not questioning these like mythologies. I don't know if how much they bring them up. Uh, I can't remember them bringing these mythologies up actually in the story ever. Um, so, but, uh, this is like, but you're talking cause, well, actually I'm, I'm rereading this. I'm realizing you're talking about cosmology rather than, um, uh, history. Um, so you're talking like, like, are we talking about like cosmology in the sense of like the universe's origins, you know, or are we talking about like, um, like stars in the sky? Cause both are, George fucks up because <laughs> George doesn't really understand how like moons, moon wor- like phases work and constellations work, and it's fine. But like um, cosmology, I was also thinking about like creation of the universe and stuff. But I think in George R. Martin's world, you're supposed to look at the history and question whether it's really supernatural or if it's if it's um, historical like ours like you know the the breaking of the arm of dorn happens at the same time as the breaking of the bearing strait the breaking of the bearing strait so like it, it the same thousands say 14,000 years ago so like you're you know we don't need the children of the forest the children of the forest breaking the arm when like you know ice ages already answer it that kind of stuff so um so I think George R. R. Martin was just applying like our history to to Westeros, um, while Tolkien Tolkien was doing something weirder with with like gods and gods creating the universe and such. Um, say winds come out. Say winds comes out. Is Fire of Blood two next, or will there be another Duncan Egg story? Um, that's a real that's a really good question. First of all, I would say that like. I think there's probably a better chance at Fire and Blood 2 or Duncan Egg coming out than wins. Um, I know that George has said otherwise, but it's when you're talking like what is going to lead up into a show, do they need material for a show? Like that's more important. So, you know, I think we know that Night of the Seven Kingdoms is, is uh, Night of the Seven Kingdoms is happening. Um, if they, you know, that's a pretty short, relatively speaking, like it's easiest to do the Duncan Egg story. It's easiest to do She Wolves of Winterfell, the next one, um, to fuel that show. Um, you know, it, House of the Dragon can still be working on Fire and Blood material for a while. Like, but if they decide to jump ahead or something to the to the Blackfire rebellions or something, maybe he would he would write Fire and Blood two. But fire, I think Fire and Blood two is too hard for him. Like Fire and Blood one was easy because half of the story was written. You know, he'd already written Rogue Prince, Princess and the Queen, and Sons of the Dragon. All he had to do is like fill stuff in with some non sequiturs. So he did his you know he did his non sequitur on on Alyssa Farman and on or Cor- Corlys Velaryon. He just like filled in some stuff and it was done. Um, Fireblood 2, he doesn't have that head start. So I don't think he's, it's just too hard to do Fire and Blood 2. So, I mean, honest to God, I actually think that another Dunkin' Egg story is the most likely thing that we're going to see from George R. R. Martin uh, in the future. Um, Cause if, you know, if, if Hedge Knight does really well, you know, and, and they want another story with him. That's that's the easiest one. It's the easiest one. He write, you know, he writes 30, 40 pages. That's it. That one, that one's do it to get she wolves out. And that's, you know, another year, another year, year of stories. So I think like even if Wins doesn't come out, Duncan Egg 4 is probably the the most the most likely that we're, we'll see in the future. Um because the show's happening. But I mean, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll see none of them. Um, 
<laughs> Aho, young warrior. William Knife Man is definitely my fave too. But Willie Jack is a runner up. Uh, you know, her aunt is in Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, interesting. Um, I didn't know that was Willie Jack. Oh, oh. Willie Jack's aunt in the show is Auntie B. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, so um, Carmine and I just did a podcast where we talk about Echo. And it's funny because it's the entire cast of of Reservation Dogs. This is modern, modern synthesis is talking about Reservation Dogs. We um, we watched Reservation Dogs recently. And like um, the entire cast of Reservation Dogs is in, is in Echo. Um, just kind of all recast. William Knife Man's in it, <laughs> you know? In a different role, obviously. But um, uh, so I do think um, I do think it's interesting that there's just there's so few American Indian, First Nation, Indigenous uh, actors that um, that you, you end up seeing them over and over and over and over again. Um, you know, so there there is this uh, there's this joke about the end of of. Um, of reservation dogs when maximus cody and brownie were on screen together and they were like people were like oh my gosh it's like the infinity gauntlet of of old of old uh american indians that need that 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 you need for movies and they're all on screen together you know but yeah no we we um we'll see what when, when, when carmine like gets it back to me but we we have a whole we, we did a discussion on echo um, Echo, I think it's, it's, the show is quite bad, but the, the, the whole story around Echo and, and everything involved with Echo, the premise of Echo is very fascinating. Um, and so, uh, it's interesting going back and, and having the same cast and roughly the same setting. I mean, it's a different, it's a different, it's a, it's the, <laughs> It's the tribe next to the tribe from Reservation Dogs is um, in Reservation Dogs, Dogs, it's Creek. And then this is Chuck, Chuck Tao, who, who are like the, the next one over. Um, uh, in Oklahoma, but it's, it's everybody's the same. Um, Uh, George R. R. Martin has changed his mind so much. I'm not even sure it's safe to say there are only two books left. That was the plan at one point, but like five year break and the John Aria love stuff. I think you are 100% correct. If George were a younger man, like if George were a younger man and he were actually going to be writing more books, he probably wouldn't write seven. He'd probably write more, but of course there's, there's, it's probably going to be no more books. So it's probably going to be five books. But, you know, if he were a younger man and he was he were he was actually working on the series. No, I don't think the story can properly be resolved in two books. It's um, it's kind of silly to, to think about it that sense, because when you really talk about um, like his outline of War of the Five Kings, Danny's invasion and war against the others in a three act play, it took him three books to do the first part and then the second part of feast for crows and a dance with dragons like danny's nowhere close to invading nowhere close no like nowhere we're nowhere close to having a, a second dance of the dragons like it would take an entire it would take at least an entire book for that it takes it would take it like it takes a book to get danny back and then it would be like a book for them to fight and then you'd have to deal with the others. So, you know, it's just none of it, none of it seems to work. I mean, now it seems like the only thing you can do is try to get them back. And then in the beginning of the seventh book, have them fight and then really rush the others at the very end. But it's, uh, it's, um, it's silly. Um, when do we get word that wins has to be split? Um, I don't think that's going to... I don't think that's going to happen. Um, uh, it's um, 
if I mean, like, I think that would be a, a very good solution. I do, but he would have to be like finished with a number of plot lines, like another number of characters he would need to be at their end and then be willing to like split them off and then pair everybody off in, in, into the next book like he did with Feast and Dance. I don't think it necessarily, you know, I don't know if he's there with any of the characters yet. Um I mean, he could, he could, I don't know. He could probably like, as somebody like one of, one of the writer joked, like, cause he has 1100, he's supposedly has 1100 pages that he could just stop now, publish that and then continue on. But I think it's also like lumpy. Like he's got no, some characters that haven't gone at all. And some characters that are far along and he might be exaggerating and he hasn't, he hasn't actually like, you know, he needs to go and revise stuff and stuff like that. So, um, no, I don't think I don't think Wins is gonna split. I don't think we're gonna have any word of that. I, I think that 2024 is going to come and go with no news on Wins. Like that is my prediction for 2024. That we'll go the entire year and we'll I mean, he'll get a I'm still working on wins or I've been writing pages, but like we're gonna get nothing. We're gonna get no news. Like no news on it's coming out, no news on on it's going to be split it's going to be a quiet crickets year 2024 it's just because what's going to happen i mean you know house of the dragon's going to come along you know he's going to be appearing on shows to promote house of the dragon people are going to be he's going to be going to parties nothing 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 nothing's getting written this year nothing got written last year nothing nothing was written last year and there was no show there's no show in 2023 <laughs> So, uh, um, mm, 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 mm. it's so funny, like, cause you know, the, 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 the cycles of, of the conversation come back. I'm like all the way back at like, this is the discussion of, uh, what if they're the one about getting back together with the X? There's no one. There's no one. That's a silly, silly concept. Silly concept. Um, you know what's really funny about you know, and I, I, this is like something I actually wrote about even in 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 my book, uh, Dreams of Ghosts and Indians. Just one little paragraph I mentioned that like even major religions don't talk about God like making one person for you in the world. You know, like, it's not like you read the Bible or the Quran or Torah, or no, nothing in Buddhism or, or, or Hinduism that the universe would put one potential mate for you and you need to find them. Like all, like, you know, creation of the universe. Yeah, sure. You know, prophecy. Yeah. Like ownership of the Holy land. Sure. But none of them, none of them actually say that like, no, there's the, the, the universe has put one perfect person out there for you and you need to find them and you're destined to find them. Like they're the one, like even, even religion in its idiocy, like does not try to claim <laughs> that there is one person for you. And yet somehow we all get this kind of like idea, like that this is there. Um, did I get everything here? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, your Sansa God's Eye forced hive mind idea is very Expanse book nine. Have you ever watched uh, Expanse on TV till season six? Like the Proto Molecule recommend books seven, eight, nine. You know what's funny is I I I got to um I never watched the last season of the Expanse. Uh, I don't know why I I, uh, I I stopped. I should have finished it off. Um. But yeah, no, the, uh, um, I can imagine what, I can imagine what you're talking about. I, you know, I do kind of like the premise of the expanse in the sense that the plot expands so much, like in its conception, like, uh, as, as it goes. I mean, I like that concept, even though I think the story was best when it was more real and grounded in the first kind of 
the first book, um, you know, rather than it going, going on. Uh, but like, you know, like really talking about like, you know, how the, how the solar system is settled is really fascinating stuff and, and how ships work and everything. And the relation of humanity within the solar system is a fair, is a fascinating thing on this in, in, in and of itself, it being so grounded and then everything, you know, the plot grows, um, massively. Uh, and so I, it's weird that like, I mean, I, I think that's a clever, a clever concept. It's very clever, but I think, uh, I, I think I lost interest when it got too big. Um, help me develop an economic argument as why Joe Biden should be reelected. Obsequious Trump roommates are difficult to convince. Um, well, I don't know, like, I mean, you know, re realistically, I don't know if the president really has very much control over the economy. But if I were going to make the argument, you could just look at, I mean, everything like inflation's down, like growth is up, unemployment is down, like everything is great under Joe Biden. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any evidence that Trump would be better. I, for some reason, the, the Republicans have put, have been able to like try to push this narrative that the economy in America is bad. And I think it's because the, the media likes to have like scare, scare stories. Like for like two years, Wash Poe and New York Times have been publishing like, oh, you know, uh, you know, looming, looming recession, you know, and every time something's good, they're, they're like, oh, job numbers are great, but challenges remain. And you're like, it's always like this, this like doomsday scenario that never happened that never happened like everything was great like everything's fantastic like um so i you know i don't know what it is um so i mean Let's go back. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Can we go back? Um, let's go nineteen fifty to to present. The um, like U.S. unemployment is. I'm trying to think of like, let's see. <clears throat> so U.S. unemployment in the year under under uh, under Biden is now like three point nine percent. You know. Um, insanely low. Now, keep in mind, it was insanely low at the end of, of Trump's presidency too. Um, but three, think about that 3.9%. Okay. You kind of trying to like go back in time to find something like the booming nineties, the booming time for like Bill Clinton, um, in the late nineties, it was at the same level. And everyone was like shocked about that. Like they're like, wow. We didn't think unemployment could get so low without, without, you know, there being hyperinflation. And then you kind of go back and you're like, unemployment, tens, six, five. You got to go back to the '60s. You know, it had it had a period where it was like, but that was it. Like, um, unemployment, and then you can look at and then GDP growth, five point seven. I mean insanely high now this is fresh out of the the uh the pandemic but let's see um but still i mean if you want, you want to look at it like this you know this is what but this is this is like biden's economy right here's the here's america here's our unemployment unemployment spikes during the pandemic and then tch, recovered and it's like back down that back down there so like everything's great 
Um, I don't, there's nothing to really complain about. That's the thing. This is GDP growth. Okay. GDP growth for the United States. Like it's just 5.9% GDP growth. It's just, I mean, everything's like smoking hot, doing great. Like in America, like I, 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 there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing to complain about. Um, like it's really, really difficult. You know, you can see it just like still like you can see this little dip for, for COVID and then just it's skyrocketing up. Um, now let's try Let's the, the thing they try to get him on is inflation. All right, so U.S. inflation, what do we have it? Do we have it for uh, 2022? Okay, inflation in 2022 is 8%. That's pretty high. And now it's at 3.5. Like, that's like back down to like, now keep in mind that like people, people they, in the, in the, in the 2000s, inflation was pretty low. But you go before the 2000s, inflation, you know, it's pretty high. Like all through the 80s, it's like five, late 70s, double digits, you know? So inflation's gone. GDP growth is high. Unemployment's at all-time low. Like, by, like everything is great under Biden. Like there's, no, there's, there's literally nothing to complain about. So I, I you know, I just, I just, don't understand how anyone could be like, oh, but Trump is better for the ec ec economics. You're like, explain it to me. How? Like, how? Like, the proof is in the pudding. Like, America's doing really well. Like, our economy is, is smoking good um, at the moment. Uh, I, you know, what what is there to complain about? What is there to complain about? Um Mm -mm -mm. Does Milton Freeman get a bad rap in economic circles? I feel like he does. No, I think Milton Freeman is is idolized in in uh, in economic circles, um, largely for stuff that like people don't really understand or think is too boring. I mean, you know, um, I uh, you know they they kind of they kind of recognize his name and they don't really kind of like. Um, think about like what he actually came up with. Um, but like, I mean, he was, I mean, I, I don't know, like the, the things that Milton Friedman says today, I mean, like he believed that like, I don't know that that like he was he was he was not he was not yet they they hadn't yet come up with rational expectations right so he was not like part of that school but he was like in in the previous school as like um leading up to it but he kind of like had this idea of I mean free trade low taxes you know um I don't know but there, there's like not too much that that I don't know, like that. Um, I'm trying to think of something that that is is even considered um, edgy that Milton Friedman believed. Um, I mean, I guess he was he was very small government, I suppose, um, and so I guess people kind of take it back to him, but. I think maybe there, I think maybe, you know what this is? I, I think that Milton Friedman is the most famous. And so when people want to bash um, kind of supply side economics, they go to him rather than the proper source of Robert Lucas. Like Robert Lucas is the real father of rational expectations and, and um, everything that came from it. Um, and, and, you know, like when we think of all the hedge fund stuff and, and, 
the price of an asset is the price of an asset and stuff like that. And consumers act rationally and there's not, no such thing as bubbles and um, all of these things that led to hedge funds and, and, and um, unrealistic borrowing and things like that. That all comes from rational expectation models, which goes to, Mar to Robert Lucas. And I think just Robert Lucas is not as famous as Milton Friedman. I feel like Milton Friedman Somebody that's not even in economics knows the name when it's really all attributed to Robert Lucas. So it's really Robert Lucas's fault. I think that's maybe it, that Milton Friedman is getting is getting a bad rap because he's getting misattributed um, what he believes. I mean, I see this happen with like Adam Smith, like Adam Smith doesn't never believed in laissez faire economics. And yet he's most associated with it, you know, like, and when people make fun of like the invisible hand and stuff like that, or they trash Adam Smith and Adam Smith believed nothing of the sort, you know, <laughs> like, so maybe, maybe, you know, maybe people are just bashing him though. Um, Jimmy Carter just shot himself after, after having a bad peanut harvest. Um, The uh, I'm not sure what that means, but the um, has a first lady ever done a war crime? Um, I don't think so, unless you consider like Melania's uh, uh, like remodeling of the of the White House a war crime. Um, even if you're like saying like former first ladies, even if you're trying to say Hillary, I can't think of anything Hillary did as secretary of state that would, that would constitute as a war crime. Um, like even close. Um, there's, there's discussions of the, of the, of the, uh, of the Libya thing, but uh, of Libya, but um, that's, that's a whole nother story that I'd just love to laugh at with that. Cause she had she had nothing to do with Libya. <laughs> anyway, despite all of the articles that came out uh, about her uh, that she planted, saying that she was so involved in the in the Libya, in the Lib like U.S. intervention in Libya, she had no. Uh, she she did not. <laughs> so, um, wow, I'm way back on Nero, oh, the cycle of things. Um. Uh, when will there be another Europe friendly stream? Um, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. I, uh, uh, I'll come up with something, but, um, it's, uh, yeah, I'll see what I can do, but it's harder now that I'm in America to do a Europe friendly stream. Um, uh, Joshua York equals Jan Vickery equals Rhaegar. Um, I do think that there is definitely like massive uh, similarities between Jan Vickery and Rhaegar. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think Joshua York too. I mean, in a sense that like you're talking about. Um, so with, with, with all of these guys, I, I, you, you've got Joshua York and Jan Vickery. So in each story, Joshua York is a vampire who is trying to bring together like vampire factions and believes in like a more progressive path for them that involves like, you know, not killing people and like living in their world and things like this and, and, and uh, integration um, essentially, you know, it's, it's a, the, the vampire fight is of course it's, because it's a it, it's happening in in an antebellum south like kind of time you're you're supposed to be thinking about the 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 white supremacy the white the vampires think themselves superior to people just as whites think themselves superior to blacks and so and Joshua York is progressive in in the sense that he he kind of he believes that vampires and humans should be equal 
and that they should there should not be there should not be this like you know supremacy aspect to it um jan vickery is also progressive you know he comes from this very very sexist society that you know wants to subjugate women um and so he believes that like no women should be educated and and but you know the question is like how do you implement them these things practically when you live with a bunch of extremists you know and both joshua and jan fail like they're big idea men and they have good hearts but they're able to they're unable to actually implement um that now with Rhaegar, we hear about him wanting to take power and like thinking there's something wrong with with Ares and things like that but other than like his weird obsession with prophecy i don't know if Rhaegar had like a progressive belief that he wanted to like bring society towards. I mean, I suppose like asking for a great council is somewhat democratic. One could, one could argue, but I'm trying to think like what Rhaegar did. Like when you think of everything wrong with Westeros, like feudalism, the, the common man being treated poorly, forced marriages, um, women being mistreated you know what what was what was Rhaegar's like progressive attitude now it, it's not that when I don't like when I read fever dream and I and I and and um uh dying of the light it's not that I don't kind of think of Rhaegar as this like perfect this this like perfect guy that fails because both Joshua and Jen Vickery are just like these like, you know, perfect alpha males with like the the perfect uh, perfect ideology, um, that beautiful men, you know, they're good looking, they're intelligent, they're good hearted, and yet they somehow fucking fail, you know, um, they fail to actually like work the politics of the world, and so I mean in that sense, but so I think you're right that they're all similar and, and George R. Martin is writing this kind of archetype character and that the guy who is not savvy enough to actually deal with politics, who wanted to change the system. I think the failure of George is that he never really inserted what Rhaegar wanted to do. Um, unlike Joshua York and Jan Vickery, where we know straight up like what he wanted to do. But like, well, how did Rhaegar really want to make the world a better place? Well, uh, we don't we, we don't know. He uh, he was obsessed with some prophecy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that's about it, you know. Unless that's what he means, you know. Like his big thing is like, you know, he wanted he wanted he wanted to fight the others. Um. Watch George Proto Sliders pilot the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen in years. <laughs> so yeah, I read, I I watched uh, Doorways as well. So in case you guys don't know, Dor um George R. Martin, and he he mentioned this in 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 uh, Dream Songs, and and he, he talks about it a lot. How he spent like a good year of his life writing and trying to and producing this pilot. In fact, I think they they filmed more than one episode. I think they they were so convinced they were like picked up and then not picked up. Um, but he writes about this like experience with doorways, uh, where they they'd invented the show, and it didn't it never aired, and um, all of a sudden Amazon yeah Amazon decides to put doorways on this like twenty year old show. Uh, more than twenty year old show, um, just on because because they they're just they're just like content plots pop it on, and so George R. R. Martin mentioned it on his blog, so we we watched it, and um, yeah, I mean it's so very George R. R. Martin, but it's so very bad, but yes, it's kind of like sliders, but <sighs> there's so many things that um. 
So for in, so for his TV shows, having watched Beauty and the Beast and having watched um, the Night Flyers movie, like his I, the, like the idea of the male character in those is just running around being like, "Are you okay?" to the female character. That's his only role is running around and being like, "Are you okay?" and saying that line, "Are you okay?" over and over and over again. If you watch Beauty and the Beast. Like, it's just, it's all the beast does is runs, runs over. Are you okay? Are you okay? It's the same if you watch Night Flyers. And it's the same like watching this, like, oh my God, the male character just runs around watching, like saying, are you okay? And I think he, like George R. R. Martin clearly thought that his, his female protagonist was lo- more likable and beautiful than she was because she's not, you know? <laughs> she, and there's just so many things that are kind of bonkers. Like she goes in, like bites people's noses off, which is very, you know, you're reminded of Tyrion losing his nose, but she's like biting people's noses off and it's played as a joke. Like, like biting somebody's nose off is not a big, like big deal. Like cops wouldn't have fucking shot her in the face after she bit a cop's nose off. But instead they're just like, wow, wow, played for a joke. She bit her nose off. I found the nose. Like, oh, that silly girl. She just bit somebody's nose off. Like, oh, God. But it's entertaining seeing all the actors that, um, like, the the woman from Matrix is in it. And then the the guy from that 70s show. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, it is just sliders. But, and, but it's, uh, it, it kind of, like, the, the only world they're able to go to is one in which oil doesn't exist, which is like a, a kind of interesting concept, you know, for an entire show, not just like the show of the week, but it's, it's just uh fucking, fucking crazy. It, it's just ridiculous. I mean, uh, uh, there's so many little things about it that I can complain about, you know, like at the beginning, he's talking about different worlds and they're like, a world in which, you know, um, a world in which uh, Indian explorers discover Europe, you know, a, a world in which the Dodgers never left Brooklyn. And you're like, oh, you're so New York focused. Like no one gives a shit. Like no one outside of New York gives a shit about the Brooklyn Dodgers. And no one outside of New York who didn't live through that period of time gives a shit about the Brooklyn Dodgers. Like, like to put that in, it's just like, oh, how do you like, like not understand the rest of society? Like I can sit here and talk to you guys all day about the Baltimore Colts and you wouldn't fucking care and how like traumatic it was for the city of Baltimore when they lost the Baltimore Colts. Like, but you wouldn't fucking care. And I understand that you wouldn't care because no one fucking cares about Baltimore. <laughs> you got me going on fucking doorways. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you should all watch Doorways just because it's ridiculous. Uh, George R. Martin uses the phrase in the rear a lot in A Song of Ice and Fire. What's funny is he uses it once where he's definitely making a reference to taking it in the butt. Um, um, so I'm trying to think how often he makes it. Wow, 22 times. In the rear of the ball of the hall, brown lawn lounge and beneath a pillar. Then there's a stirring in the rear of the chamber. Craig Clegane took them in the rear as he tried to pull back across the mummer's forge. <laughs> Lord Baelish entered through tall doors in the rear, smiling. Oh. Huh. No doubt he would be more comfortable in the rear. Guarding the baggage train. Yeah, you're right. He does use it. It's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, it's not just like the war thing, taking them in the rear, but attacking the Iron Man in the rear, in the rear, in the rear. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's like Dornishmen exchanged the look. Um, Annie Jacobs in a song of ice and fire. No, no, not that I know of. Um, uh, 
<laughs> I would rather read the uh, Song of Ice and Fire Index than the Silmarillion. <laughs> Um, no way the Starks ruled for 8,000 years. Yeah, no, now we're back talking about history. Yeah, I don't think we're supposed to, you know, I think we're supposed to question that. I think that's right. Um, I think it's a ridiculous idea. Um, huh, my understanding is that Heroic signatures have renewed the rights to Conan, Conan, and throughout 2023, self-published through Titan Comics, they refused to sell the rights, but only give license with creative veto. Um, so copyright, copyright is um, and trademark are, are, are of course like two different kind of concepts. So like. So when Mickey Mouse went into the, the public domain this year, you have the right to um, now put Mickey Mouse in anything as he appeared in Steamboat Willie, um, like with that personality and everything. If you try to put, say, Mickey Mouse as like a caring, fun-loving character, um, Disney could perhaps sue you. Uh, if they if you put them in a little more color, Disney could perhaps sue you. Though the poster for Steamboat Willie Boat really was in color, but Disney will probably still sue you. So if you show if you show like a black and white, crazy savage mouse, you know you're 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 you're, you're fine. However, I think the trademark is also like a thing, so you can't necessarily um, call something like the Mickey Mouse show, uh, but you might be able to include um, Mickey Mouse as a character and stuff like this. So like Conan the Barbarian, like, you know, you've got, he might be in the public domain, but not all of him is, is, him is in the public domain. So not all of his characters are in the public domain. And so you've got, you've probably have somebody that owns the 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 full the 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 most of it and they can they can of course like you know allow people to rights sell the rights and stuff um and you know obviously they you don't want to give it out to somebody that you don't think it, it, that might uh, sully the brand you know you you weigh your money towards the branding and decide like what's gonna work you know because you don't want to ruin you don't want to um, if you're the rights holders for Lord of the Rings, you don't want to give it out to some porno or something and then ruin it and sully it or something like that. So I imagine something like that's going on. Um, but at the same time, like uh, I'm more cynical, you know, and I'm always like, ah, people are usually more interested in money than they are in like the purity of the property. Cause even when you, even when you look at like the Tolkien estate, right. These like British snobs that that are so worried about like the legacy of Tolkien, even they will sell it off to Peter Jackson and and, and Amazon. Um, when they know, they know that Tolkien, Tolkien would have hated Peter Jackson's like adaptation. He would have hated it, you know. But at some point they're like, well, you know, the money's good enough, you know, so. I, so, you know, I'm always a little cynical, like people give enough money, people will do anything. Right. So it's, uh, um, so they, they, they can, yeah, they might, they, they, you know, maybe they heard a pitch from Netflix and it was just like, not right for them for the price tag that they were, that they were given or whatever, but, or, you know, probably could have fallen apart for, for a lot of reasons. It's hard to know what's going on in these, like, uh, these backroom situations, you know. Um, if the shave paint has ulterior motives in his dar's red herring, what's up with the Resnack? Is he genuine in trying his best for the people of Marine? Um, yeah, my beliefs about Resnack is that Resnack is a straight up good character. I don't think there's much you can really say bad about Resnack. I mean, he might be a little snobby at different parts, but like, I know that 
he, the most important conversation I remember with Resnack is that when Daenerys thinks about leaving Marine, he is devastated because he thinks that they're all going to be killed now and that she's the only one protecting them. Um, and so like, yeah, he's, he's kind of for peace and he definitely likes his dar. Um, but I don't think that, uh, I don't think there's like much you can really say about Resnick. Um, and I think that's the whole, the whole point is that we're supposed to, you know, when we, when we read about Marine, we are seeing through Daenerys or Barristan's perspective and, Especially, I mean, Daenerys is a little bit racist and, and Barristan is very racist. And, and uh, um, you know, even Quentin's perspective, he hears from his friends and his friends are pretty racist. Quentin's not so much, but his, his, the, his friends have most of the dialogue, you know. And so we're supposed to, like, see Resnick with his greasy hair and his, 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 him sucking up as something that's, like, bad and then we hear about the perfume seneschal and daenerys doesn't trust him and stuff like that but i don't think you can find a single thing that resnack did that um that was really like evil i mean i he, he questions whether hazea died um which i think you i mean daenerys herself questions whether hazea died um, uh, by, by, by Drogon or whether she like, whether he was fake, the, the guy with faking it, of course he's, you know, but I, I think you're supposed to in the end, like be like, oh man, he, you know, if you do a, enough thinking about it, come to the point where you're like, no, Resnack, Resnack's a good person. There's no, uh, there's no reason not to like him. Um, but he, I, I think he really was, he really, really did believe that Daenerys was going to bring Usher in a better Marine. And he was devastated when, when, when Daenerys said that she was going to leave, like he thought he was going to, they were all going to be killed. Um, and everything was going to fall apart without her, which is, you know, even different from his dar. Like when Daenerys leaves, his dar is like, okay, I guess I'm ruling. Everything's fine. Like, you know, I married her for power. I have the power. It's all fine. I mean, if she's here, that's cool too. But like, you know, Resnack was, you know, actually upset, but, um, <laughs> literally just learned this is back at Re reservation dogs, literally just learned the cast is an echo. Didn't know it was about William knife, man. Okay. I guess I'm buying another month of Disney plus <laughs> you're going to be disappointed, but <laughs> you're gonna be disappointed um echo echo is what a fucking weird crazy um show and i'll tell you know the po our, our podcast that we did we about it but um is it, gonna come out soon but it, it's uh there's some really genius incredible scenes in the middle but it's just edited together very poorly there's no reason to really like echo herself she's a bad person um uh you know there's a lot of ex machina it's it's just a really really weird really weird put together thing i mean the story the story behind it was that it went to kevin feige and he's like this is un unwatchable like go back and refilm some stuff and re-edit it and you know it's passable it's entertaining it's interesting but it's not really a cohesive story um I sound like a broken record. When is the release date of your book? Uh, and will signed copies be available for purchase? I think so. Um, it, it, it's currently being edited. I think the 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 um, uh, the, the, the seven the it's eight chapters. The seventh chapter is currently being edited. So it, it, we, we, by the end of February or or March, we, it'll be fully edited, and then I'll have to work on the publishing process. I'd, I'd really like to have it out like around the time you know, House of the Dragon picks up. But yeah, um, if you want, yeah, sign, sign copies. I'll, I can do all that. I can do all that. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, 
it's been so long. Like, you know, it's been so, I don't know how I feel about the thing. I don't know how I feel about the thing. I don't know. I don't know. It's like, there's such insecurity about it. I just, I, plus I like wrote it so long ago and now it's like, I see other, other ideas that like are kind of similar since where I'm just like, ah, fuck. Like I'm like late. I'm like, had I published it a decade ago when I had the idea and like originally wrote most of it, like, you know, it would have been fine. But now I don't know. I don't know. Hopefully it'll be okay. Hopefully it'll be okay. Um, but yes, it's, 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 it's coming. It's coming. You know, um, uh, I was just, I was just working on it. I was just working on like it yesterday, actually, because I'm, I'm also like recording the audio to it because I want to read the book aloud. And so I've been recording the audio to it to make, to make sure everything sounds right. And so then the, I'll have the audio too, probably, you know, available to anybody on my Patreon or something. And then, um, if you want to hear me read my book. Um, so, um, oh, what heroic signature allow, allow is a great, but full if tropes and very un, uh, reconstructed. The CEO salary of heroic signatures, Frederick Malmberg, is a fan of Howard and a purist. I'll have to read about this. Um, Um, oh, so heroic signatures. Oh, I see. So heroic signatures is a, um, I see. So, <clears throat> so Conan was published with, through Marvel Comics up until 2022. Titan Comics took over the licensing through Heroic Signatures and began to publish their own series. Um, I see. Fumcom was, was acquired by the Cabinet Group and owns intellectual property right for Conan, Mutant, Solomon Kane, and other works on the writings of Robert E. Howard. In September 2021, Funcom stated that with this acquisition, that alongside a new game, they plan to merge these into a new heroic signatures and release a new game based on these properties. In December 2021, it was announced that they signed an agreement with Nuclear for assistance of Funcom's upcoming Dune survival video game. Oh, interesting. Okay. You know, when you first mentioned things, I kind of, I kind of was like, well, what, what is, you know, why wouldn't they be looking to to make a bunch of money from Netflix? But now I'm kind of seeing that Conan is used in a lot of other media like like video games you know role-playing games comic books and so if you're really you know if, if some netflix show isn't right and doesn't properly um advertise your other products that i could see one not wanting it like you say say you're gonna like do conan but then you're gonna do it in a completely different style does it does it advertise all the other things? Because I mean, the whole point of like, say, Star Wars is not necessarily to make money at the box office, but to also sell all of your fucking toys and all of your fucking lunch boxes, right? You know, Barbie movie, sell dolls on top of the movie, you know? And so I see now that like, if one were going to go forward with a Conan that does not properly advertise the other products out there, then what's the fucking point? You know, I, I, I think I'm getting it now. Cause like, you know, say, take the super Mario brothers movie, right? Does the super Mario, like this, the, the, the one with Bob Hoskins, um, 
and and John Leguizamo. Like, does that properly advertise Mario the video game and Mario the clothing line and plush dolls and mushroom kingdoms and all that? No. It's so far out of line that like it wouldn't it wouldn't act as advertisement for all the other things that one makes money on. So I can see being, 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 you know, I'm being the cynical economist here, but like I can see why if, if Netflix was not willing to do something in line with all of the other Conan products out there, that it would be good reason to reject it. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> his moon boy really varies. <sighs> Pretty sure that moon boy and varies are in the same place. Um, uh, like wouldn't they, wouldn't they still be at the were were they both at Joffrey's wedding? I'm gonna take this very seriously. Um, so Moon Boy is on stilts at, at, at the wedding. Um, so he's there and Varys is, it's funny that we hardly think about Varys at the wedding, but like, he's got to be. He's got to be there, right? I'm going to make sure. It's not like he could not be at the wedding. Huh. Where was he at the wedding? Why is he, why is he not mentioned? Hmm. You'd think he'd be there. Now I'm on like a, I mean, this would be a funny thing if Moon Boy and, and Varys were never mentioned in the same chapter at the same time. I mean, that, that would just, that just seems impossible. They all have to, they, they've got to be, they've got to be in the same, I'm just assuming that there has to be a chapter where Moon Boy and Varys are in the same place. Um, It was Moon Boy. See, the thing is, a lot of people talk about Moon Boy a lot, but Moon Boy doesn't appear that much. Um, musicians played. Okay, Moon Boy does cart cartwheels and like is is all around with Sansa in Clash of Kings. And then he, he, um, here we go, dances with Moon Boy is dancing a lot. He appears a lot more in uh, A Storm of Swords. He's got to be, he's got to be in the same place. Sans, I'm going to say what, what happens in Sansa 3? Come on, Sansa, what, we've got a, Here we go. Varys. Varys is in Sansa 4. Varys is in Sansa 5. Wait, no, that's all Game of Thrones. Damn it. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna fucking find this. I'm gonna get it. Here we go. There it is. Sansa 3. But there were other witnesses aplenty. The eunuch Varys, Sir Adam Marbrand. Lord Philip Foot, Sir Bronn, Jalbarzo, and dozen others. Lord Giles with coughing. Um, so when Sansa gets married, Varys is at the wedding. It was is at Sansa's wedding. 
and moon boy is at the reception dancing with dantos yes so there <sighs> unless varis like left the wedding and then changed into into moon boy no i think we proved it they were both at sansa's wedding <sighs> thank goodness thank goodness um what specific story character cornered george r, r. martin the most so i mean we don't we don't know kind of what's been the hold up with wins other than the fact that he's probably been busy i mean obviously the the, the thing we hear about the most is the is the is the Miranese not and um the big problem with the Miranese not was he had these different characters arriving at different times um he had Victorian Tyrion Quentin arriving in Slaver's Bay and this was going to affect the, the the Daenerys story and he didn't know how to have all of these like events um, that he needed to have happen with like Daenerys there, you know. And so in the end, he invented the Barristan character, the, the Barristan point of view, so that she could finally leave and then Barristan would, would handle everything. Um, and so it's kind of like, it's not necessarily one character, but it was an entire, it was really the, the interweaving of the characters that, that, um gives him trouble when storylines converge he reported that he was having trouble with cersei in in the winds of winter and that's another kind of location where a lot of characters might converge is in, in, in king's landing and like dealing with the timing and stuff so it was more about like timing of events um so it's not that he like i don't know um It's, you know, I understand that like in another interview, he mentioned that he painted himself into a corner, um, which we kind of wondered if was perhaps the he killing off Kevin Lannister was the, was the problem. But, you know, he can write these characters. It's just that I don't I, he has real trouble weaving different plot lines together, because um, if you think about one character and where they should be and like what feels um fitting and ironic and and having their having their like growth and resolution like that's all fine if you're just focusing on one person but when you're focusing on a lot of people they start interfering and i'm I, you know i'm reminded of the show and how you know euron is set up as a character that needed to be killed by either asha or theon and yet he's killed by by jamie because these these, these storylines like get interwoven and then it feels really odd and unnatural that Jamie is closing out somebody else's story or when Arya kills the Night King and everybody's like, oh, you're taking John's story or you're taking Danny's story like that. That was their character. And that's not your story, Arya. And so, like, you know, this is the problem. Uh, um and so I think he has trouble when like coming to proper resolution when you're merging books, like how do you have them have the same resolutions, you know, or, or have them proper re resolutions uh, when you're, when you're moving things together. Um, how do they all fit? You know? Um, yeah. That's my guess is that, it, you know, it was, it was Daenerys was the one causing the trouble with uh, a dance with dragons. So um, I think it's that, but it's really about like multiple storylines together is the problem. How do you, how do you, how do you fit them all together? Um, I'm reminded of something else that's really kind of random. I remember, I remember, you know, back in the day of like everyone being obsessed with Jon Snow, somebody talking about like what they thought Jamie's story was. And they're like, oh, I think J Jamie's story is 
is about him choosing duty and eventually he's going to join like Jon Snow's like Kingsguard and that's going to be like the resolution of his story. And you know, at the time I, you know, on the one hand it's like I kind of scoff at it cuz I'm just like Jamie has nothing to do with Jon. Like you're you're so you're so desperate to put Jon Snow in every story that you shove Jon Snow into Jamie's story, which is wholly inappropriate. But to give some sort of like credit to it, at least, you know, if the story were, were the plot lines coming together, like at least that would combine the plot lines though. I would never, ever, ever think that like the end of John, of Jamie's story would be joining, joining Jon Snow's King's card. That's just not, that's not what I, I think of Jamie at all, but, but, you know, giving, giving something to that idea. Um, Mm-mm-mm. Opinion of Sansa paralleling Elizabeth the First. Uh. I mean, I'm trying to think of like what if there's something in her youth that um, when I think of Elizabeth the first, I mean, keep in mind that like, we all have like little bits of history. And so like, I, I always think of her as like the woman that all the privateers would flirt with, you know, like uh, Sir Walter Raleigh or something like flirting with, with, uh, with Queen Elizabeth for some reason. Um, but I'm trying to think if there's something like in, in her childhood um, that would parallel with Sansa. Um, Elizabeth was born after, named after her grandmother, second child to Henry VIII of England, born in wedlock, uh, heir presumptive to this English throne at birth. Um, And then her elder half sister Mary had lost her position as a legitimate heir when Henry annulled her marriage, uh, annulled the marriage of her mother. Um, so I don't see anything similar there to Sansa at all. Um, child of gentle condition, uh, you know, I'm not sure. Um, her, oh, her, it's the idea that what her, her half brother, Edward the sixth became King at the age of nine. Is that the idea? And so that her half brother, like idea would be like John is her half brother. And so, um, and then. But then, you know, then, then he dies and then she ascends. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'd have, there'd have to be some more specifics there, but I don't, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if I'm, uh, I'm seeing it too much. Um, <sighs> Does the North ever hold tourneys? Robert Baratheon might be the first king who ever ventured north since Jaehaerys. It should have drawn lords from all over the north. More lords attended the harvest feast Bran put on. Um, I mean, you're right considering that it like took a month to... Uh, well, you know, it took a while. We don't know exactly how long it took, but it took a, it took a, it took a long while for uh, for Robert to get north. News probably should have gotten out and about that Robert was on his way. It was enough that Mance Raider wanted to come, but where were the hell? Where the hell were the other were the other kings? Like, I mean, the other lords? Like, you know, isn't it kind of insulting that they wouldn't come, um, considering that a king was going north? Uh, it's certainly a plot hole, I think, <laughs> but, um, um, 
Now, as for tourneys, you know, I guess I think the idea is that these tourneys must happen. I mean, Jory um, was a jouster. And, you know, so I feel like somebody must have been doing something there. But then again, I mean, and when we hear about, say, like the sister men jousting, it's more that they live on islands. That That is the reason that they wouldn't be participating in these tourneys. So we do get like Northmen, like thinking they can at least participate in a tour, uh, uh, like tourneys and such. Um, though, you know, I think this, the if most of them are being held or most of the big ones are being held, like in the South, like you, you, you might not see that many Northmen, but you'd think one would think they would have their own, their own games. Right. You know, they got to do something, right. They, they, but do we ever hear about Ned holding tourneys in the north, north, great northern tourneys or anything? Are there any tourneys in the north? <sighs> See, then there's this contradiction. I think you're uh, now. Uh, now that I bring it up, it's like. The in the hedge knight only knights can participate in certain tourneys, but I think that the rules of the tourney are different because obviously Jory participates in a tourney, and so it's all kind of silly. Um, I think you're just going to have a uh, different different rules for different tourneys. So there, there must be like non-knight tourneys happening in the north. I mean, if Jorah Mormont can perf like do well in a tourney out of nowhere and, and Jory can, they must have them. But it's just, I don't know, it's, it's definitely some contradictions here. It's definitely some contradictions. You're right. They should have come to see the king. And yeah, there should be tourneys. We should be hearing about these things, but they, they don't. it's a good point. Um, Heard something interesting about MLK and how he should be remembered. They argued ML MLK should be remembered for the themes of his final speech instead of the Eye of a Dream speech. Would you agree? Hmm. Well, I mean, I don't know about his final speech. I know that MLK generally came to the conclusion that if we're really talking about... um equality and equal opportunity and coming over and 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 um getting over the past that this involves some degree of of restitution um for for slavery and um and these ideas you know were, were a little too socialist for some um but let's see here MLK final speech in Memphis. I've been to the mountaintop speech. Um, this is it. If something isn't done and in a hurry to bring the colored people of the world out of their years long of poverty, their years of hurt and neglect, the whole world is doomed. So he was talking about some sort of, of, um, you know, whether it be reparations, some sort of restitution, social programs, whatever the case, there has to be something, um, uh, to, to actually get black Americans out of poverty. Um, And so, I mean, you know, I don't think, I don't think, you know, what he says contradicts anything that's, that's, uh, he said before. I think it's, I don't know if it's like super well known that, that, um, that Emma or, or focused on that MLK was, was, um, I don't know, uh, looking, looking for, I mean, came to the conclusion that some sort of reparation was needed um 
And I don't necessarily think that like, um, it's funny when people use the term reparation, like it, it, it's, it's not that like, that's so different from say any, any social program for the poor today, you know, like it's just, um, it's just very specific and targeted uh, on a certain like quality of, of, of human being. But, you know, um, they both lead to the same place. They're both like a goal to lift people out of poverty, right. And give people opportunity again. Um, whether it be a social program focusing on, on the poor, which would, you know, um, disproportionately, you know, aid black people in America because black people are disproportionately poor in America, um, or specific like reparations. But, um, you know, I don't think it's actually like when you actually like think about it, it's not too, um, controversial though. People can make it contra people, people can make anything controversial if they want. Um, Uh, yo, PJ, uh, it's an oversight that Bobby B and John Aaron never floated the idea to unite um, his house with Ned's much sooner since they were best friends. Um, so the idea is that that generally speaking, you don't um, betroth people until they actually like are. Uh, of marrying age and can actually like get married and and have sex you know like betrothals if they're done before that it's for very specific political reasons and so you know when you say like is it an oversight that that robert didn't unite with ned sooner and create like strengthen his, his alliances earlier robert didn't see any threat um, Robert was out of the loop. Like he didn't know that the that everybody was talking about how his kids his kids were bastards and that a war was coming. Robert didn't think a war was coming. Robert thought everything was hunky dory, um, with the realm. He didn't see it falling apart. So there was no reason for him to rush. You know, his kid is just getting to the age of marriage. Sans is just getting to the age of marriage. On a normal, non-panicking world. That's what you do. You get them, you, you, you have them married, you know? Um, it's only when, when, when things are all fucked up that you're like, fuck, uh, engage Marcel off, uh, Tyrek Lannister, you know, you, you, you get wet nurse, you know, that, that's, that's the thing to it. It's, it's only in those, in those political situations, um, which is, which makes you kind of read, um, like I say, fire and blood very differently when you think about like how panicked Damon and and Rhaenyra are betrothing six year olds to two year olds and things like that. Like, you know, that's that's wartime action, you know, because any any other action, you you wait until they're of age and then you you betroth them then. Because um, what's the what's the point of betrothing somebody like at a at a young age, right? Like it's it's um you know you have no idea what this person what's going to happen to this person like you know what if what if what if they grow up and they're and they're like sweet robin and and they don't look like they're gonna father any kids you know what if they grow up and they end up you know they're nuts you know you don't want to like lock yourself into into something where you don't know the, the future at all you know um because what, what the alliance is really based on is is whether they can have kids um to really unite the houses. Um, if you could be a maester of any house during Game of Thrones, what would it be and why? I mean, the Grand Maester is the, he's the most interesting one, right? He's the one that uh, gets to gets to sit in all the small council meetings and and advise the king on everything. And um, I mean, he's, he's going to be the, the most interesting. Um, but I'm trying to think of anybody else that like has a more interesting life than, than Grand Maester Pycelle. Um, I mean, granted Pycelle, you know, goes through some shit, <laughs> but, um, 
you know, like who's safest? You know, I don't know. Would I, would I want to be Calliote listening at doors? Would I want to be one at the at the Citadel? You know, learning about master plans, learns about scheming, you know, so. Um, let's see. Any tips for other writers, especially on dialogue? Um, I mean, I don't even know. I don't even know if I'm the greatest. Uh, I, I'm, I don't even know if I'm very good at writing, but. Um, I think when I, when I examine like George's dialogue or like Quentin Tarantino's dialogue, you know, um, every, every line is very deliberate. What I've noticed is like, you know, when I was young and you write dialogue, you start thinking about real people's dialogue and real people's dialogue. There's a lot of like, what? Uh-huh. Yeah. And filler stuff. And there's none of that in George R. R. Martin's dialogue, you know, every line has like a place to go when they're saying something important and it's flowing some way. It's, it's, it's actually not very natural compared to like real dialogue. Um, but you know, it kind of like paces and goes and, and, and keeps tempo. I think, you know, the basic thing I have with writing in general is that like, if you don't have a reason to write a line, like, why is why does the line exist and like you really once you have like kind of like real emphasis on something like why does this line exist then 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 all of a sudden it gets eliminated um you know every line has to be exciting you know like make sure that every line is interesting which is really which is really hard hard demand you know to to uh to just say like to constantly ask like why why should the reader care like in the middle of this line why should the reader be thinking about this um one of the one of the the one writer i really liked um who wrote for cracked was um one named Sean baby and um When I when I when I looked at sh like, let me think about like an article by Sean Baby. I really noticed it with him, but um, let me see if I find a good paragraph. Um, this is. Mm -mm. so like you look at like something sean baby is writing like it required so many miracles of time space and birth defects for a kid to finish reading a captain tootsie ad that it was no wonder that most of us grew up not knowing how important candy is in an emergency it wasn't until the late 19 late 90s before 911 dispatchers were issued tootsie rolls and did you know that some primitive countries still have their fire hydrants hooked up to water instead of delicious candy? Um, if you ever need to get rescued by a group of toddlers and a man in it the yellow, with a yellow purse whose only extraction plan is to quickly eat Tootsie Rolls, just let me explode with, with the goddamn plane. Just take a look at the Secret Legion for a second. And, you know, you just kind of like every sentence is so packed with like, jokes and ridiculousness and funniness that that like it's everything's so in your face like every line and i remember like thinking about his writing and being like oh my god like like there's no filler like everything is important everything has to be funny everything has to be um interesting at all times because we live in this like this like short attention span society and you know i I, um, I don't know. I, I guess I kind of thought about like writing like, like after that, like, oh my gosh, like make every, like make every line important, you know? Um, uh, which 
it's a tall order, you know, especially if one is trying to fill up an entire book and you understand that, like, why people write filler. Um, and then there's a lot of filler in different places. I mean, you know, George obviously, like, fills up stuff with, like, descriptions of food. But you read anybody else and there's, like, filler. But try to try to have as little little filler of, as, as possible, you know. Man, I'm so so far behind. People are still talking about like anything that Biden has done bad with the economy. Everyone's like gas prices. Everybody's like gas prices are down. <laughs> um, we live with Putin having nukes. What's one more narcissist going to do? Isn't the infrastructure bill a good enough economic reason to vote Biden? Um, Yes. Yes, I do. I mean, I, I think Biden's done, done uh, a lot of good in his in his presidency. Um, I think also the fear of how much bad will happen if uh, if something. Uh, um, uh, a change is uh, it would 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 call everything everything fall apart. Um, man, and now we're back talking about Libya. Um uh, first of all, like, like, if you want to, if you want to talk about well, Libya, Libya is all like, that's all Obama's decision to go into Libya, but he's not going to not go into Libya. Like Libya, Libya is a hu like huge, huge oil producer. Um, and France was already intervening in Libya. Of course we were going to intervene in Libya. So these, this is why I say these articles about like Hil it being Hillary's choice to like go into Libya are just the fakest things like they came out like right before the primaries, like uh, uh, an American election system. And they all had the same sources who were all like, no, it was really it was like Hillary convinced Obama. Like, no, she didn't. Like it was such a no brainer for America to intervene in Libya um, that it's just like it was clearly placed there because people because she was thinking, oh, people are going to wonder if like a woman can be a decisive wartime like uh a president. So we're going to like plant this story about her being a decisive wartime person, like making the, the tough call to go into war. It's like Hillary had nothing. Hillary had nothing to do with it. Like, of course, America was going to intervene in Libya. Like, it's just it's one of the silliest things. Like, you can look at the timing of all those articles. They all came out at the exact same time because they were leaked. They were supposed like these people went and talked to the media all at the same time. So now, and if we're talking about like Hillary and Benghazi, she has nothing to do with Benghazi. Um, but Benghazi is not even the State Department. So it's just like, this is why I think it's all rather silly. Um, mm, 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 mm. Uh, my favorite Targaryen generation is the Daron, young Aegon IV era, but there isn't much discussion about these guys. Any theories to be had? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I have some some ideas about it. So if we look at the, um, let's look at Baylor. Um, this is the, the, what's interesting about, I mean, and this is all like looking at the family tree and like trying to think about it this way. So this is, you know, all leading into the Blackfire Rebellion. And you can kind of like, uh, so you can look at it this way. So go back and think about how special Rhaenyra is, right? So let's just remember that Rhaenyra is the most special human being ever on earth, right? So her last child is Aegon III. And he ends up having, so Dana, Baylor, Theron, this whole crew. So the seed of Rhaenyra has passed on to this crew. Especially like Dana. Everybody wants to be with Dana. Aegon the Fourth wants to be with Dana. 
Baylor locks them away in, in, in the maiden vault so that he doesn't fuck her. Um, there's something special about her. She has Damon Blackfire. And then all of a sudden, no one wants Damon Blackfire to be, uh, to be ruler. And so we've got this interesting thing, especially when you go Dragon X, right? X chromosome passes to an XY. XY can pass to an X. X can pass to an XY. You know, you essentially, this is your connection between the Dance of the Dragons and the Blackfire Rebellion. Is, is this here? Now you can say, well, wait a minute, you know. What about Viserys? Viserys II. And you're like, well, yeah. I mean, Viserys II's wife is not Targaryen. You know, she's so, you know, he can maybe pass something on to, to you know, you know, maybe to Nerys if he's even real. That's the thing is he could have been swapped. We have no idea if Viserys is even real. Um, so there's a lot of like, weird stuff here but clearly something something happened here and the the, the sept you know the septons and the and and the old town conspiracy get get all up in Baylor, making him you know psychotically religious so that he locks away all of his his, his the targaryen children and the targaryen women so he can't have any kids with them i mean it's almost uh I don't know if you're if if you're super into the you know the conspiracy theories and the and the and the Dragon X kind of theory that that I, that I am you kind of look at it and go oh this kind of makes sense it's like why was everybody so against Rhaenyra why was everybody so against Dana why was so many people against Damon Blackfire like this this almost conspiracy of just illogic uh, illogicness to in order to on who's going to be on the throne. But, that, that, you know, I do think it's like, that's my big theory about it is that there's a, uh, that, uh, that um, it was all about, you know, the, the dragon, the dragon eggs, the dragons, and who had the right blood. You know, all these women that might have the right blood get locked away in a maiden vault so that no one have kids with them, you know. Um. <laughs> what do you mean the war crime of the Trump family's family's taste and decor might be the only virtue? I hate their politics, but I love their taste. I think people talk about like uh, Melania chopping down all the trees at the White House for her like Christmas uh, thing. Yeah, this was. um. Oh, my God. This was Melania Trump's like Christmas thing from uh from yeah, 2020. Like a bunch of like blood trees. Like what the fuck is that? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> Yeah, it's you know, you're like, okay. It was uh people were people were a little weirded out by it. But yeah, she did a bunch of like weird, um, like chopping down of trees to make things a little more minimalist. Um, but uh, that was the, you know, but obviously like, you know, who cares really about a Christmas decoration thing, right? <laughs> but yeah. Um, <laughs> that dude loves gold toilets. It's true. <laughs> um, oh, Doorways has the proto stone heart with the peanut oil gang. Kind, you know, so there's this, so in, in, in doorways, so in doorways, um, the plot of it is essentially there's this uh, there's this um, woman who has a machine a machine that creates doorways between parallel worlds, and she's being chased by another dude that wants to that that thinks she's like a pet or something, and wants to like track her down, and so she, they, she passes through her Earth dimension and grabs our protagonist, uh, who's actually engaged to Trinity. 
and then pulls pulls him through into a, an alternate world in which um all oil got eaten up by like a, a bug like they, they, there was an oil spill so they invented like a, a, a like an organism to eat up all the oil and it ate up the oil and then it ate up all oil on earth and so there's no cars and people are using horses and like there's this um gang of like of of bandits led by this like woman um who at first they think she's nice but then she uh she turns out she's evil and she has all these like they, they're, they're trying to steal everybody the 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 people's peanut oil so it's like you know it's like are they the brotherhood without banners stealing stealing peanut oil if only she were giving peanut oil to the to the poor or if she were like trying to kill a, a family of of people that 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 wronged her or something but yes this is old lady who runs this uh who runs this gang fucking all right all right all right I've seen 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 carmine in the chat he hasn't even joined um What's your take on Arain Waters? Do you think he could declare for Aegon and help the Golden Company move from the Stepstones to Westeros? Um, well, I think you know that's uh, that's already done. Uh, you know, like had had Arain Waters been an Aegon supporter, um, he would already be like part of the 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 deal, right? He'd already be like part of the of the plan right he um he uh but the golden company crossed without him never mentioned him um and you know we're 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 in the golden company's like meetings you know we we know a lot about what they're doing and who which, which allies they have and you know um they don't mention him they don't mention those ships they don't, you know, don't mention it at all. Um, now, could Arrain Waters join them? Uh, I mean, you know, maybe, but um, you know, or, or who who he, who is he like aligned with? Is he aligned with Stannis? Is he is he just a pirate? You know, um, he's clearly not with like Cersei or the Tyrells or anything like that. He just like took off, right? So. You know what's he gonna do with those ships? I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know if George R. R. Martin knows. You know, um, I mean, obviously, House Valarian itself is with Stannis, so you could argue, you know, uh, that Arrain is just with Stannis, because um, that's where his house is. Um, which it's such an oversight that Cersei even put him on the Small Council, but um. But he, I guess he looked like Rhaegar, so she 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 passed she passed it. So that's all I can say about it is that like George probably doesn't know himself. It doesn't look like he he um he's part of the Aegon cause because he had the choice to, but uh, it's it's just but that's it, you know. I mean, we'll see. He could probably he could probably be part of anything, but I'm just trying to think of like what like how he's going to come into the story even you know um but we'll see um he's so unimportant you know no one ever really thinks about him he's just he's just a reason for for cersei not to have a navy right <laughs> he's even very far away from stannis if he was a stannis supporter and Aegon doesn't need him anymore because his people have landed. Um, so who knows? I mean, I guess I'm just trying to think this through. After the Ironborn take out the High Towers and the 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 um, the Red Wine fleet, he might be the only naval force that can like do anything. Um, and and pose any sort of threat to the Ironborn, but um, I don't know what do you like. 
I don't know, you know, what he would do and why and what 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 his plan would be there. Uh, interesting nonetheless. Um, I suppose he could. That'd be funny if like the Ironborn, like, you know, take Old Town or around Old Town and they're thinking everything's really great and then and then Arain Waters comes in and wipes them out. Would be would be unexpected. <laughs> um. Yes, late dumb theory. Everyone is Azora High. Hercoon, Edric, as in these people contributed back to back uh, in the LN, the Long Night, meaning everyone in the story is Azora High. Danny, John, Theon. Yes, they're all the last hero and the last hero's friends. Azora High is the friends we made along the way. Um, <laughs> I think it's crazy, like to go through and and. Uh, and see these uh um the, the completely different conversation of the chat <laughs> um could Rhaegar's daughter be alive if Aegon was spirited away why wasn't uh, uh Rhaenys could she be Arianne she does find the letter about Quentin um the thing about Rhaenys is Rhaenys was stabbed and we have no, we have no um, many times and we have no stories of about her being unidentifiable. Um, she's just dead. And um, I know that in a very odd, suspicious, like so spake Martin, they ask about this and, and he, George actually says, well, what I can say is that Rhaenys was killed. And everybody knows that she's dead. And then, because he didn't want to say that Aegon was dead. So I will say that, like, at least George, at the time of that so speak, Martin thought she was dead. Rhaenys was never described as being unidentifiable. Um, and so uh, I would say that I think she's probably dead. I, you know, it'd be, it would be a bit much to somehow have her back. Um when when she was only she was only stabbed and george said in an interview that that she was she was uh, alive i mean she, she had been killed um um least favorite romance language you know i only um I mean, I, I obviously I'm familiar with like uh, uh, the, the Roman, Romance languages I've actually heard, you know, OK, there's French, Portuguese, Spanish. I've heard Catalan, um, Italian and Romanian. Um, like, I, I, you know, all the rest, you know, these minor ones, I don't, I don't know. I, um, so what's my least favorite Romance language? I mean, I don't have a problem with any of them. I find French very difficult, I, uh, pronunciation-wise and everything. Uh, it's, and I know I know none of it. While like when you know studying Spanish, like you can listen and hear, you can understand Portuguese and Italian pretty well by studying Spanish. While like French, I just kind of lost. It's not that I dislike French. French is you know a very beautiful language, but I don't understand it. Um, even Romanian, when I listen to it, I'm like, oh, you know, I kind of kind of get some of that. So I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, um, you know, I, I, I guess just by default to be French because I can't understand it, even though it's a beautiful language. Um, this is about Sansa. Parent dishonored and killed. Fled and feared for life. Not expected to reign. Third in line. First woman monarch. Dudes drool over. Ginger learn statecraft through danger and survival. Hmm. I mean, I suppose. I mean, you know, the uh um um I'm just trying to think like I mean I suppose in the show Sansa reigns as monarch. Um but uh uh
let's see All right, third in line see that's see the problem with the third in line is at what point in the story because obviously when the story begins sansa is fourth in line and so yeah then rob when rob is around she's third in line but then but then uh rob dies so now she's second in line um if bran is king or if bran is supposedly king now you know so it, that number thing is a little suspicious you know it's a little it doesn't really work um first one monarch would be the case yeah it's true dudes drool over they tend to drool over all the all the monarch women right don't i mean it doesn't every monarch woman like uh, don't they always drool over them i mean people be like catherine the great cleopatra like don't they all just want to bang the bang the woman in charge power power is sexy kind of thing ginger um i suppose though it's more you know it's auburn in in, in ice and fire you know i mean i you know it's fine um How did the Knight of the Laughing Tree enter the list against three specific po opponents who, who weren't the defenders of the birthday girl? <sighs> um, <laughs> I mean, there's so many things wrong with the story that it's hard to... Okay, so they allow a mystery knight for some reason. But of course, like nobody can, nobody can vouch for the fact that they're a knight. This is the whole thing of like, in the hedge knight, the whole plot of the hedge knight wouldn't happen if, if like, if Dunk was just like, I'm a mystery knight. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, who did you knight for? Doesn't matter. I'm a mystery knight. <laughs> like, oh, story over. Um, I mean, I guess that, that, that doesn't affect the puppet show incident, but nonetheless, uh, the his whole problem there. Um, uh, let's see. Who were he? I'm trying to remember. I so in in um so this is the thing about jousting is there's different rules for jousting. So yes, there's bracket jousting, but then there's something else where there's challenge jousting, where you have a position in the rankings, and then someone within a certain uh radius of you in line can challenge you um and so because these guys were like um they were like the knights over the squires right that that beat up howland reed maybe they were not that great however i think one of them was like a porcupine knight which is the blount family which boris blount was supposed to be a great jouster so it's hard to believe that like Blount, Blount wouldn't have been a you know bad jouster, but nonetheless, there was a challenge system. If it were a challenge system um, joust, you could pull that off. But I would have to like think back about the Heron Hall tourney because you know about how that happened. Um, it might also be like why Rhaegar was able to like um win so easily because he just he just had his like king's guard challenge him his friends challenge him and then him lose you know so um i want to say yeah Anyway, I I, lo I looked into all the jou like jousting like systems when when I was when I was researching for the uh, the Elaine the Elaine chapter and how things went. But yeah, there was, um, but it's just I think it might you know you could maybe make that argument, but I don't know. It's probably also George. It's just a story, and George didn't really think about it. <laughs> 
what's more offensive that George hasn't finished wins or he hasn't finished any of the projects that he started taking away from writing wins. I mean, House of the Dragons on the air. Um, we'll be watching Three Body Problem with Netflix. Um, hold on. Let me, let me bring uh, Carmine on here. Hello, 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 hello. My love, what are you doing on? Why? It's it's fucking it's twelve a.m. for you. What the hell are you no, doing? Just fin finishing up this, finishing up these, finishing up these bloody these bloody super chats. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I know it's. Midnight. I got your message. I got your message on Facebook like super late. I'm like, uh, it's okay. yeah, it's I okay. can jump in, see where you at. Yeah, no, I mean it's a little, little, you know, it's a low, low, lower key, lower key. Just trying to get through this all. Be um, um, how you been? I've been all right. Uh, don't worry, I have your, I'll have your echo and the 2023 combo tomorrow. I'm finishing up Baldur's yeah. Gate. It's consumed me. So, yeah, did I? I told the story last week that like uh, that. Like Carmine, we had, we had all these plans. We had all these plans, and then, uh, and uh, I mean, the months. As far as I'm concerned, the months not over. Did you see man carrying things uh, video about why YouTubers don't put out videos that much in in January? Yeah, yeah, he did. It. Yeah, I did. About for uh, for the audience who doesn't know this, uh, January is usually a very bad month for ad revenue. Mm -hmm. um, for some reasons, advertisers just don't push it out as much in January. February right, is even because, worse because they so. they pushed everything out and for Christmas, and then they're like, "Okay, let's let's uh, recoup our costs." And because yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're like, no "Usually the best thing it's January. Why why would I why would I advertise a bunch of stuff for people to buy stuff in January? They already did their buying." Yeah, true. Usually the best day. Usually the best time is around springtime. Usually from July to December. Usually the best times. Yeah. Um, will you be watching Three Body Problems on Netflix? Um, and how do you deal with regret or a traumatic loss? <laughs> it's a simple one and a big one. Um, a lot, I, I will be watching Three Body Problem. Um, um, so Amber from Road to uh, Tor, Tor Valar, I'll be um, doing a podcast with her um, uh, 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 on it. So we will we will be doing that. Uh, I do plan on watching it, um, and we'll see we'll see how Dan and Dan and David are uh, are, are doing on this. Are you going to watch it, Carmine? Uh, yeah, I might. Uh, it's going to be on Netflix. So all the episodes are going to come out at once. You guys going to do a full season review? Is how it going to come out that? because all Netflix comes out? Well, I thought Wednesday goes week to week, right? I have no idea. I didn't saw, I didn't see Wednesday. Does it? I know that that like you, I mean you're right that that's how, um, the uh, Netflix was in the past, but I think they did start doing some like weekly. No, you're right. Fuck, they're all coming out at once. <laughs> Damn it. I don't know. Like um, eight episodes all on March 21st. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I'll have to binge it and. Uh, and, and, and talk to her about it. Yeah. Oh, mm, good bad. luck. It's so I, bad. I wasn't for... planning on. I wasn't planning on checking it out. But uh, if you tell me it's good, I'll check it out. I've heard some early reviews say it's not bad, but it's um. You know, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, that's the thing. Is like, it's not that we know that Dan and Dave are capable of doing great work, right? Because the first seasons of Game of Thrones are incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the first, the, yeah, they're they're good at adapting, and the three body prop is already completed. I I like the second book. I thought it was really good. Yeah. I did not enjoy the third, but that's just me. Um, how do I deal with regret or traumatic loss? Um, I don't think I necessarily have any like legitimate, um, like, like in my, in my rational mind, like, I don't really have any regret because it's like, I like where I am. And so I understand that like all of the choices of my past led here and stuff like that. Um, but certainly like still as a human being, you look back and go, ah, oh, I should have fucking done something differently. 
Oh, I should have done that differently. Oh, I can't believe when I was in middle school, I said that. That was really stupid. How embarrassing. You know, I'm sure my, my mind is like filled with those kind of fucking things too. Um, so I don't know how to deal with those. Just keep reminding yourself that like where you are and who you are right now is a great place and that you wouldn't be here if, it, if, if you hadn't made those mistakes um, and had that trauma in the past um, that it makes you, it makes you who you are. So, uh, you know, like the, the plot of flash, I suppose. <laughs> um, but that's about it. I mean, it's tough now, now traumatic loss, like with death or something. Um, I don't know. Like I, I, I really liked, uh, I don't know. There's, there's some, some interesting philosophy that, um, that I read after my father died and stuff like that, that, uh, that helped me through it. Um, um, but I don't know. It's, um, like, you know, I, I wrote, I read, read a, read a whole bunch of like weird Buddhism stuff that I don't necessarily believe, but like at the time, like it helped me like through like some trauma at the time. But, um, um, you know, so, uh, Alan Watts is really great. If you want to, if you want to feel better about like loss and like feel better about the universe, like, and like get through like a really hard time, I really recommend listening to Alan Watts. Um, he's, he's very, uh, he's, uh, you know, for, for the time you're in, uh, you know, if you're hurting, I, I think he's great to listen to. Um, I agree with your point on MLK. They claim I have a dream speech was more hopeful and metaphorical, but this speech was more political and practical. However, media doesn't today doesn't focus on that. Well, I mean, I think like focusing on the abstract and the, and the, and the good quotes that, that uh, MLK has is always like more abstractly inspiring. You know, you get to go, Oh, that's such a beautiful, wonderful line, you know? And then you don't, uh, you don't have to actually think about, you know, the political realism of, of, higher taxes to to deal with the fact that there was slavery in the past you know or segregation and things like this but uh yeah how are you celebrating your mlk day uh carmine uh when is it again when is it <laughs> okay i forgot what it's it is right I... now man it's well it's not right now for you but it's right now for me it's mlk day oh shit uh i don't know what what, 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 do, what do people normally do on mlk day to celebrate you dwell on the teachings of Dr. King. <laughs> which one? The one where he cheated on his wife, or like which one? Is, which one of the, the letter? The letter from <laughs> Birmingham Jail. Um, uh, uh, justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That's a good one, I guess. You know, this this, this is something that someone was having a conversation with me about a while ago. Like how all of history's great men, the big great women, they get fucked over by those great men. It's kind of sad to think about, but yeah. oh, sure. Um, have you ever, have you ever seen, uh, have you ever seen this photo? Um, this is a great, this is a great, great photo. Let me, you ever seen this? The MLK mugshot? I've... No, I don't think I have. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah. But, uh, no, I mean, you know, MLK is a great writer. Great, great, um, great ideas. You know. Thank goodness we have a day to him. I get off, so it's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's not that great anymore now that I have kids. Now it's like, oh, they get off too. Now I got to take care of them today. <laughs> um, instead of Joffrey, you, uh, Preston, is Robert's firstborn male and become king. Who is on your small council and why? And what do you do about Ned? Who is your bride? Um, oh, so so the idea is that I am still literally like um, a Lannister, right? And that and that I need to choose like a uh, a small council um, to get through everything. Um, 
Well, first off, like, obviously I'd get rid of Varys and Littlefinger because fuck those dudes. And, like, anyone with half a brain would have seen fuck those dudes from a long way away. So I'm Joffrey. Okay. I get Roderick the Reader uh, on my small council. I get, um, God, who fucking else? Uh, get rid of Pycelle. Can I get, oh, I, forgot. I can't do it. How do I get rid of Pycelle? Gotta get, gotta get rid of Pycelle. Wait, P- Pycelle was, was he already stripped? No, he gets stripped in, in after the, after Joffrey. Okay, so, um, who else do I have on this, my small council? Uh, Carmine, who, help me pick. Um, Bronzeon uh, Royce. I get Bronzeon wait, any, Royce. Anyone in the, wait, anyone in the kingdom? Yeah. Oh, anyone. Oh, dude. Mm. Um, no civil war? I think the idea is you want to consolidate your power and be king. So at this point, um, I mean, obviously, like, I don't behead Ned. That's silly. And I don't send Ned off to the wall. I would keep Ned in the black cells. Like, I would not have that guy going anywhere if I were if I were Joffrey. Like, what a what an incredibly stupid, like, like idea. You know, to, to kill him or send him off to the watch. No, 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 no. This is this is an interesting conversation. I love to make a whole. I love to do a whole podcast yeah. on this because. And Griffin needs to be more specific because, are you are you Robert's true firstborn or is it like Jamie? Well, I mean, Cersei? Joffrey thought he was Robert's first trueborn. I mean, Joffrey doesn't know that he's a bastard, so I don't think it matters in that sense, because like you're you're just in Joffrey's perspective, knowing what Joffrey knows, you know. But he's saying here instead of Joffrey. So right. instead of Joffrey, you're you're Robert's true firstborn. So there's nothing to do about oh, Ned. Oh, well, that's le- 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 that, that's less interesting. <laughs> 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 what if what would I do if I was Joffrey? It'd be more interesting. If I'm his trueborn son, then then well, geez, everything changes. Stannis isn't a problem anymore, right? Um, because there's no there's no super sleuthing. Like Ned is not true. a problem anymore because there's no Ned super sleuthing. That's true. Um, gets you know all the problems go away if I'm trueborn. Well, if this is like first book, first season, then Tywin immediately. Tywin is hand. Yeah, Tywin. Tywin though, like he he's 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 too much power. He'd take he'd take. Like I understand it'd be very difficult for me to say no, considering that like my mom is regent, and 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 I can't really like stop it, you know. But it's yeah, that's the problem is that like. Joffrey doesn't really have any power except for his back channels, you know? So, um, because his mom is regent and his mom like has Tywin come in and takes control. So jo- I mean, Joffrey pulled off executing Ned, um, cause he was, be- cause he was back channeling, but man, it's, uh, it also depends what kind of King you want to be. You want to just sit back and chill like Robert did. So mm-hmm. you need someone like a Tywin or a John Aaron or a Ned to run shit for you. Um, if you want to be proactive, uh, I would also say Tywin as well. Tywin is just a good hand. He, he gets shit done. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I pull in a small council of like people from around the kingdom. I, I'd, I'd certainly pull in, I'd certainly pull in like Ironborn, like making peace with the Ironborn would have been number one priority for me. Um, like pull in like multiple people in order to try to get on the small council in order to try to get that, that, that fleet. Um, you know, I think that's, uh, I think that's pretty essential. But is the Ironborn fleet stronger than the red wine fleet? Why not just get, you might think that like, Oh, it wasn't needed, but, um, red wine fleet, you know, I mean, can't have, you can't have too many ships. (laughs) (laughs) can't have absolute domination of the sea and then just win, you know, just win. Um, sorry if I've already answered this in the past. Who do you think Arya will kill? Uh, I mean, I think generally speaking, the, the, um, the death list is, is what she's going to be like focusing on. And I think that like, you know, um, Dunson, we don't know where Dunson is, but let's say Dunson is still in, is also in Bravos because, we're not sure that Dunson was sent to Bravos, but he's probably sent to Davo, to, sent to Bravos. So she'll probably focus on killing Dunson next. Like she, she just killed Raph the Sweetling. 
So and I just killed it years ago when that ten years ago when the sample chapter came out. Um, she killed she killed Raph the Sweetling, and then she'll probably kill Dunson. I think as the Maria, she'll probably kill Illin Payne, and then she'll focus on like she'll focus on trying to get to Cersei in the mountain, who are in King's Landing, and so I mean I think that's generally where she's going. I'm trying to think of is anybody else on the list that I'm I'm forgetting I'm like uh, Arya's what's Arya's current death list? Mm, 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 mm. I have to like look up Arya on the wiki. Um, Arya Stark. So what 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 you got going on, Carmine? What, what what else what else what else is going on? I mean, uh, I stuff and stuff. I had a I had a wins question for you actually. When you're done with this. Oh really? In regards to your fanfic. What what what's the question? Finish finish uh, my man Simon's here super chat first. He gave you what is that two thousand? What is that yen? Yeah. <laughs> Japanese. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, so she's currently who's currently alive on her. She's got Dunson, Queen Cersei, Ellen Payne, and uh, Marin Trant. Hmm. So the thing is, like, the, and the mountain, right? So, so she thinks the mountain's still alive. So obviously, mountain is in King's Landing. Marin Trant's in King's Landing. Cersei's in King's Landing. <clears throat> Dunson is probably in Bravos, and Ilan Payne is in the Riverlands. So Ilan Payne gets killed by, by, uh, by Numeria. Dunson gets killed in Bravos, is my guess. And then she's got three more to do. She's heading to King's Landing. It's just that's just got to be where she's going. Um, unless they all evacuate and head to Castle Rock or something, and then she's got to head to Castle Rock. But I don't think she's like focused on killing anybody else. Um, I mean, she probably will kill some more people, like, but I don't think she'll be focused on anything else. Um, is Jamie still Warden of the East by Winds? <laughs> it's such a forgotten concept. I think everyone will have forgotten what Warden of the East means by then. <laughs> In a Game of Thrones, like, there was this big deal about Jamie being made Warden of the East and sweet robin being called true warden of the east and then the wardens like doesn't really make any sense anyway so they just kind of drop the concept anyway so what were you asking carmine for for your fanfic for a fanfic yeah. being called winds of winter there's not a lot of winds or winter happening in the fanfic you haven't focused on the north yet what's going on oh yeah well well i mean there's the focus of like the winds the words or wind aspect to the to the, like the ravens but like um <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come to the north the north will come um well it's yes absolutely how many how many chapters are you in like you're easily over 10 chapters right now um uh we are 20 chapters with regards to, um, here, I'll bring up the, uh, the question is like, how many have we done versus George? Um, That's another thing I was going to bring up with you in regards to the Tyrion too. Okay. So. Yeah, um, people are waiting for you to get to the Bolton stuff. Stannis, Jon Snow, Sansa, what's going on? What's going on with the? Well, you already got to Sansa briefly, but still, only one chapter. That was a big uh -huh. chapter. It was a huge chapter. Um, Let's see what we got here. Uh, so, twentieth uh, chapter is coming out fairly soon. Mm -hmm. um, call is out on the twenty-first chapter. Oh, we got and, Jamie. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Daenerys too. Oh, that's gonna be a, that's gonna be interesting. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know which 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 ones to to work on there. So um, if we're talking about like what have we done versus George, um, yes, in this twenty chapters that are pretty much done, um, one, 
two, three, four, four and a half, five, six and a half were George's, mm. right? Am I counting that right? So I didn't realize Tyrion too was George because when I when I when I went through it, I thought like you got to the end because we briefly you we briefly talked about the end of your your Tyrion fanfic chapter, and mm. I was like, oh, he didn't do the ending that we talked about, and then and then because <laughs> we didn't know we were talking about Tyrion three, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Will uh, in comes in in the comment section. He's like, no, this is all George. Yeah, the Tyrion yeah. three is going to be rich. I didn't realize George put out that much stuff. Yeah, and I haven't even gotten in. He, of course, has the the Theon and Mercy chapters after this, but um, as well. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to. And think the Aaron chapter. Have you done Aaron yet? Well, I popped. Yeah, you it did. In you there. did. For, forsaken. Yeah. Yeah, Harrower is Aaron too over here. This is which I don't know. I don't know if this is the order of when of when we're going to put him. You know, do with them. But I just kind of popped them in. Pop the pop the names in there. Why not? Right, so so George did George did Elaine, Arion, Arion two, um, and then Forsaken. Half of Victorian, that's yeah, four and a half. Barristan, five and a half. Tyrion two, six and a half. And then we kind of know that like, you know, these other ones exist, but he read them, but we don't have copies of them. And then and then Theon. The Asha fragment and uh, mercy, you know. So, nonetheless, that's about. Let's um, we have here is one one quarter of the of the word count is one to nineteen and and, and such. There's no way you're gonna be able to finish this in like 50, 60 chapters. There's gonna have to be a Winds of Winter Part Two. There's no way. There's no way. We're going to have to get a Winds of Winter part two here. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We've got to totally mention, by the way, Warden of the East. We've got to mention it just because it's such a, such a fucking stupid thing, but it's got to come back. It's got to come back, even though it's so fucking stupid. <laughs> All right. Um, people talk about the House of Black and White, but what about Caso, King of Seals? The King of Seals. He's one of the street performers in uh, in Bravo, in, uh, in Bravos. Um, um, the uh, one of the things that 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 I find so I I have been thinking about like um, oh shit. I didn't realize that there's another Caso. There's Caso King of Seals, but there's also Caso Mogat, who is some sort of mongrel of the narrow sea, fathered on a sister in whore. Hmm. Um. Anyway, the um. So one of the thing, one of the the theories that I'd I'd been playing with is whether whether Arya even had her face changed in the, in the ugly little girl's chapter. Like he tells her like, Oh, your face is going to be disgusting. But then she just, but she feels her face and she's like, but nothing's changed. And he's like, no, no, trust me. You're ugly. And then she goes out. And I always play with the idea of like, what if she actually never changed her face and she's just walking around as Aria and they told her that her face was changed, but it wasn't, hadn't, hadn't changed. Right. And so I was playing with this idea, but when she goes, she goes back to Caso and, um, and like, no one really like does anything. They don't really like wave hi to her, but they don't, you know, but they also don't gawk at her and go, Oh my God, what an ugly girl. So it's still kind of up in the air, whether her face changed or not. I don't know. Uh, it's just such a funny idea of like, they go through this whole ceremony and they're like, oh, your face has totally changed. She's like, no. Nope. Um, okay, fine. Am I getting to the end here? Getting to the end? Getting to the end? Oh, thank goodness. Last one. I'm going to get to go to bed. Okay. Victorian is unknowingly creating a syncretic religion. 
Um, oh, yeah. He's a uh, syncretic, meaning, meaning um, combining different forms and different beliefs and practices. I mean, really all religions are, are syncretic. They're always, they're always like taking in um, other religions and blending them in and, and like trying to unify to, in order to like get, get, uh, get more believers and stuff like this. It's, it's fairly, fairly common. Um, but yeah, the fact that he's like both of, 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 a drowned god follower and a follower of Relore at the same time is 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 kind of funny. Um, I wonder if it's going to be a contra, you know, um, a problem later, or if it's going to be a strength. Like you know, when Victarion returns to Volantis or whatever, or past or whatever, if he chooses to go to Volantis, um, how would the or how would the tiger faction that's on that ship or whatever, if they're all Relore followers, how are they going to feel about him and things like that? Would they, would they all of a sudden become part of Victarians, like you know, um, fleet? You know, they all think Daenerys is the, this 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 chosen one, but if Victarian has a dragon, maybe he's the chosen one, and they'd be more willing to fo follow him. So, um, anyway, I have to. Uh, It's going to be this uh, back in a clash of kings need to submit petitions to Rob is heavily stressed. Then Roderick orders Umbers to provide lumber without hearing from Rob. Fishy, no? Um, I have to reread that. That's that's interesting. I, I mean, it's a good thing you've mentioned this to me because I'll have to reread re that weirdness if that's it. But anyway, Carmine, thank you for uh, thank you for being here with me here late. And um, mm -hmm. let's talk. Let's talk this week and, uh, and 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 do some stuff this week. Sound good? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. All right, man. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you.